Harry's going to let her sign his right there. I've already said that. I could have done that. Just a minute. Are we happy started? Are we ready to start? Yes, okay, sir. welcome everybody. This is the uh, special Joint City Council Workshop Planning Commission meeting for January 16th, 2024, City of Bonnie Lake. First thing we always do is stand and salute our flag. So if everybody can stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam Clerk, could you call the roll, please? Mayor McCullough. I'm here. Deputy Mayor Carter. Here. Councilmember Baldwin. Here. Councilmember Bolton. Here. Councilmember Hughes. Here. Or or Al Swanton. Councilmember McClymon. Here. Councilmember Rowe. Here. And Councilmember Swanton. And then the Planning Commission. I have Planning Commissioner Chair Spalding. Here. Commissioner Bennon. Here. Commissioner Dahl. Here. Commissioner Slover. Here. Commissioner Jeffrey. And Commissioner Wilkins. Here. All right. Seems that we do have a um, agenda month of the uh, Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you again to the agenda to Item D to uh, table it to clear the weather forecast until February 6th. Sponsor well, in agreement with that. Do we have to the formal motion and all of that? Put it to a vote. I think we should do it. All right, let's put it to a vote. All in favor of tabling D. Um, do we have a second? Oh, I guess we do have to go through all this. <laughs> Any discussion on the matter before we take it to a vote? All right. So, all in favor of uh, table nine D on the agenda tonight uh, due to uh, weather um, restrictions. Uh, any opposed? Okay. It's like that we have table nine D for D. All right, now we'll go to the uh, planning commission vote on discussion. Sullivan, floor is yours. Carrie, yeah. can you make the mic, please? Say that one more time. Can you mute your mic, please? My mic is on. Can you hear me? She's, yeah, we can hear you. She's asking you to mute it because we're getting feedback here. Okay. But you want to say something. There we go. Yeah. Ah, very good. All right, Ms. Sullivan, could you uh, start us off with? We're going to get the gist We're going to get the presentations pulled up, make everything go in, and then I will we'll get, get moving forward on this. Once I get the okay from the city clerk's office. Okay. And start it. Do you want me to go ahead? Nope. You have to share it. Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, nice. It's over. Are you next to it? Yeah. No, it's there. Yeah. <laughs> 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 this one works in nice. <laughs> yep, that's one. There you go. We good? Now you should be good. All right. Good evening. Council and Planning Commission. Um, we thought this would be a good time to do a joint briefing with both the Planning Commission and City Council as we get kind of close to the end of our parks plan project. Um, as we put it in the agenda packet, this is something we've been working on for about 14 months. Um, getting close to the final stage, but we still had some feedback that we needed to gather from the Planning Commission and City Council um, based on comments we received um, over the time. So 
Um, tonight, we're not asking for any action. Um, we are asking for uh, to look at how we've divided the projects up, how we kind of the conceptual designs, and if there's any feedback, we'll gladly take it. Um, but tonight is more about providing a briefing about how we're kind of dividing this project up, the timeline for the project, how we're grouping projects, and the kind of the, the background for uh, people who have not been part of the process since kind of day one. Uh, so that was being said, I'm going to turn it over to, so yeah, so we're going to do an overview of the project, uh, what we've heard so far, some key project recommendations, a discussion on those so we can help reform the plan that we will bring back for to the public. There'll be many more opportunities to provide public comment. We will be doing an environmental analysis and there's a public comment period tied to that. We will also be doing a public hearing with the planning commission before adopt, before they make their recommendation. There's a public comment period before that. And for all of those, the actual plan will be released because um, we'll have it finished written. We're in the final stages of doing that right now. And then again, when the council does their adoption that night at the council meeting, there will be a chance for public comment as well. So many more opportunities. This is more for us to kind of engage with the elected officials and planning commission one. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Steve Dew, who's with uh, Conservation Tax. He is the lead from the consulting firm that we hired uh, to walk through this presentation. Um, we have tried to incorporate changes that we've heard over time and kind of provide some additional background. So that, Steve. Thank you, Jason. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, Council Members, Commissioners. Uh, again, for the record, my name is Steve Dew, Conservation Techniques. I, our firm is leading the effort, it's a team effort, uh, to help the city pull together the Parks, Trails, Recreation, Open Space Plan. Um, as Jason noted, we've got a brief presentation to hit some of the highlights of what we heard and dive into uh, the specific site master plan before talking about time frames and moving forward. So, just doing the slides. There we go. Um, just as a refresher, I know many of you have uh, participated in prior conversations about this project and and or attended past events. Uh, but the Parks, Trails, and Recreation Open Space Plan is intended to be the city's 25-year guide for all things parks, recreation, trails. Um, so it takes a long-term view of enhancements, improvements, and upgrades for the city's park, trail, and recreation system. As part of that, it will also have a focused six-year capital plan that will help identify key projects to move forward in, in a more tight time frame or near term, which will help guide and inform future budget discussions uh, between uh, the council and staff. As a reminder, the process so far has been a robust community engagement process. We've heard from over 1,800 participants in the process over the last year. That includes uh, several different ways in which we've heard from folks, primarily through a community survey. Uh, but there was also substantial event tabling during the summertime. Uh, we held three or two public meetings. Uh, one was online and the second was online plus in person. Uh, stakeholder discussions and a project steering committee helped guide the direction of the plan. So overall, we've heard from a lot of people and the survey provided some really strong baseline data. As for the survey, um, again, we had just about 850 responses from the community on that. Um, and as part of that, it was an English and Spanish survey. Uh, it was both a random sample mail survey as well as an online only survey. So those two data sets were kept separate. We aggregated the information um, moving forward and just want to hit some of the highlights. Uh, one point is virtually everybody who took the survey, 95%, feel that parks, recreation, uh, trail opportunities are either essential or important to the quality of life in Bonnie Lake. Uh, so that's pretty substantial. Really get much higher than that. Uh, so it's good to know that the community feels that there's value in parks and recreation. Um, additionally, about two thirds feel that they're uh, either very or somewhat satisfied with the parks and open spaces the city provides. Um, so again, there's a little room for improvement there, and part of that is that the city has some undeveloped sites that we'll talk to in a minute. As far as reasons for uh, coming out and you know, being active in parks and uh, on trails, etc., walking and running came in at the top position there with the 65%, again, two-thirds um, coming out to be active on trails to walk, to run. 
Um, and that actually is quite parallel with regional, statewide, and national data that uh, trails and trail usage comes in at the top and has for probably the last 20 plus years. Um, so seeing consistency in the survey responses helps us feel comfortable that we're getting some good feedback from the community. Uh, the second tier, the kind of medium blue color there on the chart represents the um, kind of no cost, low cost sorts of activities, things that are either family oriented or group oriented, like uh, going off picnicking, uh, you know, playground with your with your family or more solo endeavors uh, like relaxation and fitness uh, things again you can do pretty easy on your own schedule and are generally on the program moving down the list we get to more specialized activities and more programmed activities whether it's sport programs proper or uh, being out on let's say a sport court uh, playing pickup games uh, participating in programs and then further down the list, you get to more specialized activities like paddleboarding, skate parks, things that represent um, some great uses of facility space, um, but also are a smaller number of the population that participate in those activities. Um, as far as some reasons why people aren't coming up to Bonnie Lake Parks more often, um, a couple comments were that there's not enough parking, they feel it's too crowded, that's primarily about Allen York Park. Um, and or don't know what's offered. So a communications issue about what's available and where to go and how to be active in the city. As far as program amenities or priority amenities, I should say, um, we asked a question and basically said of this list, how supportive are you of having the city add these over time? Um, one thing to note is Take a quick scan down the, the blue tones there. Majorities of residents responded favorably for all amenities noted. Um, walking and biking trails came out at the top again, consistent with the usage that we noted in the prior question. Um, so again, internal consistency between questions is handy. Um, and, but beyond that, you really get into um, the notion that there's a latent demand for a lot of different activities in the city. One thing to note is that we use this data to help inform the four site master plans that we'll talk to in a moment. And nearly every one of these items rep is represented in those four master plans. We also have about recreation programming. And in the realm of programming, uh, it was more of a Goldilocks type of question that we asked is the porch too hot to cold or just right. Uh, but in this case, it was a list of program types, and we asked, um, are there too many? Is there just the right amount or not enough of these? Um, so you can see just by the chart that the, the interest in the community shows that there's fairly good balance between what's offered and what's needed. Uh, there are a few items that uh, do rise to the top in terms of uh, late need, and that's around family programs need for additional community events and youth activities. Uh, beyond that, you get into more specialized programming and also the notion that you need some space, uh, classroom space, school space, et cetera, to facilitate some of those. So taking the, the feedback from the community survey, taking the feedback from the tabling events, and the other discussions we've had with the community, a couple core themes surfaced uh, from all that information. One is, really the notion of taking care of what you have, renovating and, and upgrading your existing parks to make them more functional, more accessible, um, improving ADA compliance so people of all abilities can participate in recreation activities, uh, addressing safety and maintenance, primarily around trail corridors, uh, making sure that they're clear, they're lit, they're well signed, and upgrading playgrounds over time to make sure that they are both safe and functional. Uh, another core item is just continuing to build out your system. As I noted earlier, the city does have several parks that are either undeveloped or underdeveloped. Um, so building those out over time um, will help add more amenities. And there's uh, some strong support in the community to do that. Um, part of that is building out the trail system using Fennel Creek as a spine and linking to that over time to tie the community together. 
and then adding more user conveniences, things like uh, restrooms, parking, signage, uh, picnic areas, benches, uh, just to enable folks to be active, be out, and be um, comfortable. The third core item is expanding recreation opportunities, and this is the uh, this is related to the chart that I showed earlier, where most the majority of people said they want everything. Um, and that is that uh, there's demand for uh, pickleball, additional field sport space, disc golf, off leash, uh, playgrounds that are accessible and all inclusive. So, again, people of all abilities can utilize them, um, as well as splash pads and additional events. So, again, that relates to what we saw in the survey, but it also relates to the concept plans that we'll show in a minute. Before diving into those concept plans, I want to just do a couple quick slides as a teaser for what you'll see in the draft Park Trails Recreation Open Space Plan, um, and that's around the notion of different system analyses that we did in, in the draft to date. One is around the idea of examining system gaps, and those gaps can take different forms. Um, in particular, uh, gaps around distribution of parks and trails and open space. So physical access, who has uh, proximate access to a park or who has to travel an exorbitant distance to get something that's uh, useful to them. Gaps also exist in the term of accessibility, and by that I mean ADA accessibility and uh, universal access. So looking at improvements to make sure that people again of all abilities can uh, recreate and participate uh, and then the gaps also come through from our site assessments where we got our land city architect visit all the properties uh, to make sure that the city can plan for an interesting park system that provides diversity of spaces and different ways to engage um, and then again, looking at today's population needs, as well as going out 25 years. Quick snapshot of what this map represents. Um, it is what we call a, tra a travel shed map. So if you focus on the kind of pinkish hues, those represent travel sheds around the city's park properties. So what we do is we drop a pin on the map, just like you do when you tell your phone, hey, how do I get to this location? Um, and from each and it represents a legitimate, a legitimate park access point. It's not a proper boundary. So it then links to the, the street network and we can kind of tie all the pins together to create these areas, these little blobs that show if you live within the pinkish hue, you're within, in this case, a half mile of city park. If you're outside of that, then you're in kind of the white background color. This particular map also shows homeowner association parks. Those are in the kind of purpley color. And those then are done in the same manner, but they are trimmed to the subdivisions because uh, the homeowner associations are typically private and affiliated with a specific subdivision. So we wanted to represent that. So the plan itself, we'll talk in more detail about this, but we can a quick snapshot of this so when you see it it's a little familiar so to it's you. kind of a walkability thing it's it's, it's a, tra a travel shed so it's based on a distance not a not a travel time it <laughs> so it makes sense the way i'm looking at it okay yeah, and with the white areas i'm looking at the white areas and they're a lot closer than some of the pink areas are to the allen yard it's it's based on the road system so if if there's a disconnect in the road or a creek passes through or there's no way to go from one side to the other, then it, it kind of cuts it off. So instead of a, a circle on a map that you can kind of fly to, um, we can look more in more detail if there's specific areas that don't make sense. <laughs> well, and then there's parks that aren't on there and stuff, but that's okay. That's good. We can look through that. So next slide, Jason. The analyses also look at some metrics, um, and this chart is uh, a variation on something that the Washington State Recreation and Conservation Office put together as a tool in their planning manual. And the RCO, or uh, those who might not know, is the state's funding agency for all things parks. So utilizing their tool helps the city pursue future grants um, in that 
you can share information in a way that they're familiar with seeing it. Um, so in this particular case, the, the metrics include things around quality of existing facilities. So that quality comes from data from the survey um, about people's sense of, uh, of importance around parks, the quality that we saw on the ground from our site assessments. Um, it includes metrics around distribution related to the maps I just showed. Um, this one particularly is trimmed down from what's in the plan, um, but also looking at usage. Uh, so again, you're starting to track some benchmarks. So going forward, if you repeat some of these analyses or some of the questions in the survey, you can track them over time. So are you saying that your survey generated that need for satisfaction? Satisfaction. Yes. Okay. And that satisfaction is based on, again, the aggregate survey data around how satisfied people are with the current system. So as parks get developed or as Allen York gets improved or Midtown gets built, I would imagine this uh, value would change in a positive manner going forward. Is there a way to compare that to other municipalities? We can local. We can yeah. look at it. We've done surveys throughout the Puget Sound region, and we can see what's uh, common. But each survey is a little unique, so it's maybe a little apples and oranges. But we can take a look. Question I have yeah. is: um, Did you do any sort of uh, return demographics? People actually returning surveys. Did you have any sort of um, demographics involved of, as far as? Um, uh, family, single, age, and but particularly what part of the city they were. <laughs> Three of these four, yes. Okay. So we did, yeah, we did age group, we did um, households with without children, by <laughs> family children, as well as region. So it did, we just split up that? the city in, I think, okay. three or four different quadrants. Thanks. Yeah. I just had one question, too. You said that there was um, 1,800. Uh, people that had responded, and then in another section, you said that there were about 800 or so. Um, I, I'm trying to figure out what's, what's the difference between this two. Yeah, thanks. Um, the community survey captured responses from 843 okay. participants, okay. survey respondents. So that's how many surveys we collected. Yeah. Um, the balance of that 1800 came from uh, tabling events that were, I think, 11 different tabling events during the summer where we had uh, displays, people would put down yeah. stuff, okay. as well as open house, the three, two different open houses. So, so is, is that 1800 with the 800 something or so respondents, or is that? 1800 total, which includes the ones that responded in the survey. Includes. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Bozen told the total number of surveys that were 843. That was how many were responded. Correct. How what was the total count of surveys that were? We mailed up 2500. And again, it was a split method survey. So the mail survey. Uh, was mailed out to 2,500. Honestly, I can't recall the, the number of returns on the mail survey, but it was probably on that even guess. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd have to look that up. I don't want to misspeak. We tried to do, when it came to the survey, we kind of tried to do it two ways. One, we tried to do, we did a statistically valid method where the consultants randomly selected 2,500 addresses throughout the city. We mailed out responses. We mailed out specific surveys to those addresses um, to get a statistically valid survey that way. Um, but we also wanted to gain broader feedback from the community. So we took the same survey, but then just opened it up to, to the public um, so that we could gain a wider breadth of responses. Um, but we kept the data pool responses separately in the analysis of the consultant. So we did it both ways to try to cast this wide net. So this is the random. This, the 59% represents the aggregate of the 843 responses from the survey. Thank you. Is there another question? Yeah, I just, uh, again, I'm not trying to make this a long-winded discussion, uh, but I, I have mentioned it before, it just, you know, when we're looking at mathematics and we're analyzing this data and this random sampling, um, and then you have 843 responses, 
request that you know additional to then create the kind of a larger buffer from the cable events and things like that. It just still feels very much like a, a small percentage of the community and not a representation of the community because I, I, I mean, we're talking 20,000 people um, in a city. And I understand how random sampling works and you know trying to figure out how to you know best represent the populace and what they would want. And I guess that's just, I don't know that, you know, 800 people, you know, making decisions that are really big, helping make a decision that is very large um, is the best way. I just think that Bonnie Link needs to, I don't know if there's another method to try to figure out to reach a larger amount of the populace. I will, I will, and I will say we have done every tool that we can afford to do. Right. Yes, there's always more and more and more you could do, but there's also a cost to do more and more. And I, and I would I would caution to say that the 843 represents 843 people. It represents 843 households. So Which is still a fairly small number in comparison to the one team. But that's 20,000 people, but I think we have about 3,500 or about 500, about 5,000 housing units, somewhere around there. So you, you have to compare the numbers you're looking at. I agree with you that the yeah. 20,000 and 800 are different. The yeah. other part of it, too, is. Stop, uh, there's something. Hold on, just oh, a second. Okay. Um, the, the question that I have is um, with this, with uh, actually, Councilmember Baldwin's question led into what I was thinking. And as far as the comparative analysis to other cities, are we, uh, the response that we got, are we in the lower category, are we in the higher category? It's about average from what you get from all the other municipalities out there as far as you um, achieve your data. Yeah, great question. And um, again, we've done community surveys over the last 15 years in the Puget Sound area. And um, I would say that the response rate on this was about average. Average? Okay. Yeah. I mean, there are certainly communities where we've had stronger responses, but we've right. also had lower. Okay. So it's it's a comfortable number. And what I've noted earlier about internal consistency with questions, it also holds true across the different subgroups. So we also looked at the different responses by subgroups. So different age groups, different locations of the city, different household composition. And for the most part, um, there is consistency between the general response and the subgroup response. So even though you know, it's a smaller sample size in aggregate relative to the community size, um, the internal consistency makes us feel comfortable that the responses are legitimate, if that helps. Okay. Uh, and uh, Ms. Sol, did you have anything to add? I'm sorry. I I think, think, off on no, no, I think okay. Steve brought that up further. All right, Councilmember Bonds. I guess there's one last question about the grading uh, idea. There is that. Is that have you ever seen um, how many cities uh, would say their satisfaction is B or higher? Few. Okay. Mm -hmm. And satisfaction is a tricky one in that it's a snapshot in time and it's based on when you do it and what they see on the ground. So if there's a news event that causes a negative <laughs> reaction on a survey that comes through and you can't control that. Okay. So that's why you want to do periodic resurveying of different types of questions. Yeah. Okay. Ready to move on? Excellent. So in the last teaser slide uh, for the, the upcoming plan that you'll see is uh, this one in particular about trails. Uh, so we also as a plan are planning forward. So we looked at the trail system as it is today and started to think about what that would look like as a conceptual grown uh, evolved trail system. So we looked at um, trail access and distribution. So we did travel shed mapping for trails, much like we did for parks. Um, so that'll be in the dot. But for the conceptual trail system, we are looking at um, recreational trails, which I'm calling off road trails. Uh, so think of Fennel Creek and think of uh, what will be the Notches Memorial Trail that goes east west, um, but also on street connections to just create that connectivity between what you've got and, and the other infrastructure that exists in my lake. Um, so that's made distinct on the, on the map by two different colors. Magenta, purpley color is uh, the recreational or off-road trail in the blue 
is the on-road connections and the dash represents uh, future, solid represents existing. Um, so the, the map really is intended to show the future conceptual network. And uh, we've labeled them by uh, different trail segments. And some of them have alternative routes that we've noted in, in a superscript. Um, so again, this is just a teaser at this stage, just to show that we're thinking through how the community can become more connected through trails and um, sidewalk enhancements. Um, I'll leave that at that. <laughs> so moving on. I just yeah, want to come on that one. Yeah. So moving on, I want to transition into the four different site plans. Uh, I believe you've all seen these in various iterations in the past. So I'm not going to really walk through all of the components, but I do want to walk through the grouping of how those components could be constructed going forward. So as you yeah, so as, as Steve walks through this, I want, I want the commission and the city council to keep in mind that we're talking about the 25 year build out of the park system. So this is when we if we did all of this and we got to day 25 years from now, your park system has basically built out. Um, and then you be talking after that about what's next. So this is really kind of a, a holistic, comprehensive look of a 25 year plan that we're going to take in smaller chunks over time. So we're not envisioning this to happen overnight. This is a, a 25 year plan. So we're trying to figure out how to group these projects. And it's going to be important later of how we play this out. So I just kind of want to leave that in. Sorry, Steve. That's no, fine. And, and as part of that, um, the notion of grouping comes as uh, you know, construction efficiency, certain amenities are either located next to each other or can be done in a similar uh, work environment. Uh, so there's some efficiencies around how you group things. And also there gives you the potential for pursuing funding or specialized uh, resources for any of the particular types of grouped projects. So as a project team, we try to just identify ways in which we can chunk out the different park developments um, because again some of these are substantial investments and you're not going to be in a position to do a project like allen york park all in one big bite uh, there's a lot going on here um, so let me just walk you through how it's segmented and uh, we can go from there so as you can see in the graphic um, we've got them labeled by letter and you can see the, the call outs on the side so area A represents what would be the Northwest parking lot, and that would be for car and for boat trailers. Um, so that would uh, support the boat launch, but it would also support the sport fields that would exist in the north corner. Uh, area B would be a conversion field four into an uh, artificial turf, a multi-sport field and would accommodate uh, some space for um, uh, temporary portable restrooms uh, going forward. And A and B can move forward potentially as a, a linked project or um, earlier because neither of those rely on what would be the rerouting of West Naps Highway. So that's another consideration. So moving through the graphic, um, area C along the water is the boat launch relocation, boat queuing, and some piers uh, to really improve the function of the boat launch space and to accommodate uh, improved turnarounds and um, again better access to the water for trailers. Uh, area D is one of the two core central parts of Allen York that would exist on the uh, on north side of the rerouted West Apps Highway, and that would include the amphitheater, the Great Lawn, uh, a maintenance building, and some uh, other related improvements. And adjacent to that in area A or area B e would be the playgrounds, uh, spray park, concessions, restrooms, picnic area. Um, well, I appreciate your courtesy on the description, but the lawn ain't that great. Mm -hmm. It won't, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the project's the main the lawn. Right. Yeah. <laughs> David, I'm afraid the lawn made of great. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Uh, um, and then adjacent to um, 
the, the playground area. F is the beachfront upgrades, and F and C could potentially be grouped together to then assist with permitting enhancements and other waterfront or in water work that might be needed. And the beachfront improvements would be basically bringing in sand, enhancing the beach, the, the feel of the beach, and relocating the sand volleyball. Area G, H, and I are kind of a core area on the south side of West Half's highway rerouted. Uh, G would be the uh, southern parking lot to support the things on the south side. Uh, area H would be the uh, new basketball court, uh, renovated tennis court with pickleball lines. Um, and I would yeah. be primarily trails through the rest of the, the park to link things together on the north south basis and represent the northern extension of the Fennel Creek to Allen Park, Park Trail. Um, last in area J there would be a playground that would be part of a project that's adjacent to five that can move forward also separately. Not in this park. Questions about a dog run. We have that in Mexico. Yeah. <laughs> In Midtown, there is at the very bottom, you can see Dog Park uh, in, in the, we can get to that in a second. Um, Midtown, a slightly smaller property that accommodates slightly fewer number of uh, sub areas to, to work with. How'd you get smaller with Midtown? I thought it was 40 plus acres. Um, I, I think Councilman was talking I think he was referring to as compared to Alabama Park, which is significant. The entire the all you take all of yeah all chunks of midtown park or at, at Alabama park that's I think it, the scale the, the park's just less this one's only 40 acres as compared to Alabama park which is in there <clears throat> so midtown um area a would be the um, central sports field one of one of two sport fields that again would be artificial turf with multi-sport field space uh, pickleball complex of six courts plus uh, parking to support that core central area. Uh, area B would be set aside for community and senior center relocation. Uh, area C would be the spray park and playground and additional parking to support uh, that portion of the park. Area D would be another, the second of two sport fields, again, artificial turf and multi-sport and the remainder of the site area e um, represents everything else which is uh, trails throughout the site um, bike skills a mountain bike course uh, pump track disc golf and off-leash dog park uh before we move on um uh, the uh and i'm not even going to get to question the percentage of the parking spaces versus what what we have to be those parts. But what I'm not seeing on there is the ingress, egress, and the um, um, and what might be developed around the park to accommodate the additional traffic that would be going on to uh, have people um, available for the park. Was that considered in this? I would defer to Jason. Yeah, the, the access for the park, and it's adopted in our future road plan, is to extend 100th, um, which is along the north side of the park and it ties in 204. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's the traffic signals that go out to both 410 and South Prairie. Um, and then our adopted road, our adopted future street plan, 100th is mm -hmm. extended all the way over to 214 mm -hmm. to provide access that way. So that's kind of the yeah. network of access. Um, because of the stormwater falling, we really right. can't get a lot of access directly to South Prairie. Um, so that's kind of how the access as overall was looked at, is trying to get people kind of to the 214th or 204th, and then from there out to 410 or South Prairie. And is that uh, uh, those issues been brought up with the Tarragon negotiations? Because that particular issue came up a couple of years ago as far as what they were going to develop as, in, in that area as far as uh, 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 accommodating the additional traffic that would go on. Yeah, so, the, so there's the Tarragon project, which is under a current development agreement, and at this time that's kind of still sitting there. Mm -hmm. um, the adopted future road plan is part of that extended road network mm -hmm. uh, in both uh, adopted by the city council as part of the future roadmap. So any development that would occur on the Tarragon property to comply with that future road network uh, and build the development around that future. Okay. And then, so just some other highlights. Um, 
Um, we did update this plan, I think the most significant based on comments we received from the city council. Um, two things to kind of keep in mind, you'll notice that there's a building two in right next between C and B. That building is not something proposed to be constructed by the city, only a pad left. Um, we have heard questions about whether or not there would be availability for other agencies or groups to provide indoor recreational space. Uh, I think one thing that was discussed at the meeting was possibly working with the city of Sumner on an aquatic center. Um, we've heard conversations about maybe having the library there as part of some master complex. So what we felt we could do to continue to move forward our plan as other groups and agencies want to come forward with as it relates to indoor recreational facilities is to have a footprint big enough that would accommodate that. Um, and so it's not in our funding package. It's not going to be in the capital plan. It's simply a placeholder that there would be a basically pre-developed building pad that we could partner with somebody on an additional indoor type of facility. No commitments from anybody, no selection, but it provides that opportunity and that option over the next 25 years that we don't not have the space. And if it does materialize, we can figure out later what happens to that. Um, and it's important to note that of the two fields, currently um, the second one could only be built if we didn't have to extend the stormwater pond. Um, this assumes that we don't extend the stormwater pond. Um, you'll see at the bottom here, um, if we have to extend this stormwater pond, we'll cut into the amount of square footage that we have to retain from tree canopy, which makes building the second sports field a little bit more difficult. So that's just something that we're going to have to monitor uh, over time as, as we build this. But the way it's currently laid out, we look like we can get to the, to the fields and that additional space. As opposed to going down to Sumner, if you thought south, like to Holly and the developers that have gone there, I'm sure they're going to be using a lot of these facilities. And so, um, yeah, I, mean, I was just saying that any of those any of those groups or agencies can reach out to us. We're just trying to preserve space. Okay. But have you, I know you've planned it, but has that been in the consideration thus far? In, in what way? In in what way have you thought of it? I, I know, but I'm, I'm trying to be like in, in. You said you discussed being, uh, you know, uh, being in like co-partnership with the city of Sumner. Have you thought about the same thing with, with the Holly? Is that even been considered? Yeah, we, we've talked with the county about ways to partner on regional parks. Okay. Uh, We've talked to their county, their planning staff at the parks. What staff. about the developers that develop the community? We have not spoken to new one homes, no. Okay. We've said we've tried to stay, I guess, governmental, governmental agency to governmental agency, mm -hmm. knowing that the developer for new one homes is kind of don't don't you think that private donorship is really the only feasible way we would be able to develop any of this stuff? I don't know yet. Okay, because we need to be thinking beyond just the municipal and governmental agencies. Correct. You know, exactly. Like even approaching some of the tribes around here who've got plenty of money. And um, and they are, they can actually help because, well, we'll get into that a little bit later, but we need to yeah. expand that. Yeah, all funding options are on the table. I just, we hadn't got to a point where we had an adopted plan to be able to talk to groups about that level of financing okay um, because they're going to want to know what are you building at this point we don't have an adopted plan to say this is what we're building i know that Kiwanis has reached out in the past about wanting to build a splash park i know the rotary down in puyallup helped right. with their camp their coverage so yeah all of those things are on the table okay um but the first part is getting to a plan that you can adopt so then you can have something to talk about okay i hope that answers your question no it does okay i appreciate it thanks Oh, uh, Councilmember Oh, Councilmember Holder, you waiting for you. Okay. Can we um, investigate possibly under the community center slash senior center doing underground parking so that we can have more parking and then for the senior center that could, you know, people could have access to elevators and ramps and not have to be outside but that would free up the outdoor parking for the the sports fields when there's something going on we can look into that i will say getting back to the mayor's comment that as a significant cost 
Um, last time I looked at underground structured parking, you're talking ten to fifteen thousand dollars a stall. So, but the number of parking stalls you're going to you're adding a significant cost to the project. But it's something I guess if the council wants us to put all underground parking, but then we would be able to move forward in phases because you'd have to build the senior center and all the underground parking first, which would Kind of not allow us to start moving on some of the like the, the initial ball. Hey, and uh, Councilmember Brooks had a question. Uh, so land use, I'm just wondering, is it? Can you, what can you do in your stormwater area? Can we move the dog park and the disc and the dirt bikes all in that area? Is there? So we are uh, we are using the stormwater pond for up to part of the 18 hole golf course, this golf course, uh, in the dry months. The 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 part of the challenge is the stormwater pond has already been cleared. Um, and when we did the development agreement and the environmental impact statement for the WSU Forest project as a whole, um, part of that was an agreement, part of the mitigation of that environmental impact statement was that as part of Newtown Park, we would we would maintain about 22 acres of tree canopy. Um, and so where we put like the dirt bike trails, the gift golf and the ball and the ballpark is we're using those areas that we're maintaining as tree canopy because we don't have to clear them to do those facilities and then taking every other inch that we can clear and putting in the other facilities. So it's it's kind of a, I guess the way somebody says, even if you move the dirt bike course, you still wouldn't have the, land, the tree canopy available to remove to put in additional tree tree cleared areas. So we're we're trying to play like a Rubik's Cube game and we kind of, the, the direction I gave to the consultants was I want to max out that retention or minimum get it down to the we're right where we have to be to meet our environmental mitigation. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just how we landed with being able to, to get the two ball fields in here if we don't have to extend the stormwater pond. I say. Based on the agreements before, I'm just I'm skipping ahead to how do you pay for all this stuff? <laughs> all right. So, 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 so I would say I would say hold on and let me get to the next slide. And you'll kind of see how we're starting to look at this and then kind of what our okay. negative. Which well, is real quick. I don't know what the agreement was, but can you sell off on 214th there to private business and generate revenue to fund the rest of the park? We can now. We we in theory we could. We would just have to figure out how we're balancing that canopy coverage. Um, and two, the stormwater pond is mainly what's along 214. Or uh, South Prairie Road. Two from the from basically D over yeah. 214 is all currently owned by yeah. uh, Terracon. Yeah. Or Midtown Properties LLC, I should say. Yeah. Then right. we can always like underground it if we had to, depending on funding, obviously more expensive, right? And so some of that could be undergrounded. They do that. And if we underground it, doesn't that make our property more valuable? Yeah. Just mm -hmm. Yeah, it'll be the issue. It's 6040. Yeah, uh, basically split that they came up in 2009 where Tarragon it was the 60 crop, uh, the 60 acres that you're talking about in 214, and we're talking about the uh, 40 acres that we have in certain parts right there. But I'm just yeah. talking about right yeah. here, just if you could push back yeah. into the dirt bike area and even move the stormwater up and leave that 214 area for so this is actually 100. This right here, if you were to be out here, this is that movie view. Right. Yeah, that's the talking on the diagonal 214. You can't do it in the stormwater area. Right? Well, there's no 204. 204th is way over here. Yeah, that's uh, there, right, right, oh, South okay. Prairie. Okay, South Prairie, sorry. This is South Prairie. Right. Yeah. So you could, this pond is already constructed. So I guess, in, yeah, you could do something in that area. Right. That, that would be in. That and would you be move the stormwater out of there as well? Huh? Can you move the stormwater up so you have the other area on the other side of the. That Cosby. would cause us to redo all the work that we had Visconsi do when they built the Costco. And that actually, that that would, that stormwater pond was pretty expensive because it's actually, and it's actually regulated as a dam because of the amount of water it can hold back. So moving the stormwater pond is easy on paper. Mm -hmm. Moving the stormwater pond um, in practicality is extremely expensive because that's, that stormwater pond serves basically Visconsi. That whole development plus where the Trapper Sushi and uh, movie theater is at. Okay, so that stormwater loop extension then is already. This big. part has not been developed. Okay. So that's what I'm referring to. That yes, part. so we could sell it um, right now under our current development agreement. We're required to allow Terra to 
basically construct part of their stormwater pond there. Uh, and that's why we said if it gets built, if to, you know, there's there's lots of if then statements. Um, the development agreement with Tarragon expect, expires at the end of this year. What about uh, Ponderosa and all the uh, Pierce County properties that are across the street from uh, uh, South Park? Do they utilize that, that stormwater as well? Or no. Okay. There is a little county stormwater pond right here. And that was done when the South Korea improvements were done, but this county maintains it. It's like a catharsis. All right. Oh, uh, let's see who we have uh, first. Uh, Council Member McClymans and then Council Member Paul. Yeah, so building two um, up there, did we coordinate with the school district and see if that area was large enough for the school district aquatic center? We made sure it had enough square footage. We did meet with the school district to make sure that both the consultant and I understood their needs um, but they can't make a commitment because they've already got to adopt the plan and they're working through their process but it does have the square footage we made sure that we understood their needs and said that is kind of the the goal you said needs well i i guess when if you look at their proposed aquatic like center how big it is right. what is in it right how much square footage they would need i guess that's what i'm saying is the okay good yeah, because they were concerned about having enough square footage to have sanctioned events. Yeah, we, we, we looked at what they were proposing, and I believe, Steve, were you on that? I was not. I, I, think, I think Scott was on that call, where we actually talked with the school district and tried to get a better understanding of what an aquatic center looks like. Um, but as I said, because they already have their adopted plan that they're moving forward with, there wasn't any commitments, and they could, but we, do under, we did want to at least understand what the sizing requirements were. Okay, Councilmember Baldwin, and I believe Councilmember Roche had a question. Yeah, oh, this, this all looks so amazing, like just how everything has been put together through all the different ideas. So um, great job. Uh, I think the only question that I have, and maybe if you play disc golf, this might be offensive when I ask this, but um, when I'm looking at kind of all these other areas, I can see, okay, yeah, like a lot of different types of people are going to be able to use that at that, the dog park, except for the disc golf. And I'm looking at just even just the size of it. Um, and so, yeah, I guess is 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 that going to attract a lot of people? Because I've been to different areas, and I always see just an empty. Well, from, area. from who we've been contacted by, and the, I will say the, one of our highest responses from the survey kind of came from that group. There's a lot of people passionate about it. Um, and we felt like it was a good way of, we felt like it was a good way of using the tree canopy, right? So there's that area we have to retain as tree canopy. The yeah. nice thing about the disc golf is it just went into the tree canopy. Yeah. So it was a it was a low cost way of putting additional improvements in the park. Yeah. That well, took advantage of yeah. something else. Yeah. The same with the dirt, same with the mountain bike in trail. Not a lot of not a lot of clearing in that area. Right. Um, so we were able to to put an improvement in that provided additional capacity without having to remove basically tree canning. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. And Council Member Roach and then Council Member Fold. Okay, this might be a side conversation. I know we're setting up meetings to meet with you and others for the, those new guys, but um, you mentioned something about Tarragon's agreement expiring in a year. <clears throat> so it went from beginning, but I'd like to learn more on that anyways. What does that mean? Where are we with that? Can we potentially partner with the project we're trying to work on here? I, yeah, I think that would be a great side conversation because there's lots of um, interesting history. Yeah, lots of history. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Councilor Mayor Yeah, I I do like that you added some sports fields um, to this. That's great. Um, appreciate that. Um, I would like to go back up to um Allen York Park quick on section B and looking at that parking lot there and I'm seeing like we have an existing parking lot that's that's sitting there at Allen York Park and it doesn't have trees. We're talking about making that parking for the boat launch. And I'm concerned by adding trees to a parking lot that is for boats. 
we're going to end up taking out some trees with those trailers. Those those are long trailers. And the, the parking lot right now, as it exists, does not have trees there. So why are we adding trees to, I understand like you've got to have like this tree canopy, but like right next door, we literally have a forest right there. And it's pretty shaded right there. And I know like California, they went and painted all of their streets white. And that supposedly helped to reflect the heat from the um, from the um, sun from absorbing into the black pavement. So it became white and that helped supposedly. I don't know, but um, I well, those are going to have to be very strategically planted trees. Well, I can I can say that in the in the conceptual designs that we previously presented, that parking gets converted back to single vehicle parking to have the parking for field that new field right there. So there wouldn't be boat trailer parking in there in the ultimate design, and it gets reconfigured and laid out to maximize it, which means we need to add the trees in. And it also is the offset for the trees we'll be removing in area A to provide the other boat trailer parking in area A. So we're moving boat launch parking back up to uh, up to trailer uh, up to section A. Sometime between yes, as the plan evolves over time. Okay. And we have to remember this is a 25 year plan we're talking about. It's not like we're putting everything in the next two. Well, months. hopefully some of these things can get done before um, I find a Gravestone to live. Well, we wouldn't want you living in the gravestone. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, okay sorry. Yeah, I, sure um, thank you for your time. And is, no, it's all good. These are great questions. And it's better to get clarification at this point in the process than later on. Um, just jumping ahead, uh, we've got two other concept plans just to walk through. One is Victor Falls Park. This one is very straightforward in that uh, the intended concept plan is to enhance and improve the existing parking lot, um, pave it, and uh, add improvements for ADA, uh, provide a trail along the north side of the, the creek with three viewing platforms, um, provide a picnic area and also some safety improvements along that trail corridor yeah. um, just so users are protected. So this one is very discreet and it's in enhancements. Yeah. Uh, the last one, Cedar View, um, again, a smaller neighborhood park uh, broken up into smaller chunks. Um, so area A, which is the existing uh, play field, uh, would include a uh, enhanced baseball backstop and uh, regrading, uh, reseeding the play field, um, a new covered multi-sport course of uh, basketball and pickleball, and parking along 206. Um, area B on the north side would have the uh, spray park, restroom building, and parking along 90. Uh, the central part of the park, uh, area C, would be an upgraded playground and natural play area, and then area D, would be um, enhancements to the existing parking, which would be uh, paving that as pulling parking and then adding three additional picnic shelters. So again, the intent of these concepts are to give guidance going forward, but also to start thinking about how to break them up into more uh, digestible chunks. And then we just kind of wanted to close. This is an update of a slide that we have produced before. Uh, one of the big things that we've heard through this process is the need for sports fields and sport related access throughout the community. Um, so this was kind of a slide that we had prepared and we now updated it to kind of show the the additional facilities that would be added. So everything that's kind of in a red box on the slide are, are, are fields or facilities that are getting added. So you can see all of Midtown Park is getting added, um, but we end up adding about six baseball fields, uh, three multi-sports fields, a number of pickleball courts, um, a couple of different basketball courts, both indoor and ex ex outdoor. Um, we also have shown the Reed property because we're working with Mount Rainier Football Club. 
uh, to develop that property would definitely not let it feel to kind of get to the mayor's point about working with private interest. Um, so that would be an example of how, how we're moving forward with there. Um, so those are just kind of to give a concept overview of all the different, hopefully different sports facilities um, that would be created as part of this plan. Um, kind of getting to the overall second part of why we kind of group these projects um, is we know we're not building this in the next six years, the next 10 years. It's a 25 year plan. So yes, it goes all the way out to 20, basically 2050. Um, and so what our, our strategy and approach is, and it's kind of, there's a couple of reasons why we kind of piled it this way is we've listed the projects on the left kind of with that different those nomenclatures a b c d and e and when we would likely build try to attempt to build those projects out um the reason that you see the northwest parking lot all the way elevated to 24 26 is leslie and i were doing some research uh, and there's a grant available currently coming out this year um, for boating facilities which includes providing boat building boat trailer parking so there's a grant opportunity so we kind of move that part of Allen Park forward by itself so we can try to chase that grant. Um, we'll see what happens there. Then the rest of it really starts to swing over to Midtown Park and we spend about the next eight years developing different facilities in Midtown Park. Um, the first one being that first sports field in Midtown Park along with the pickleball. Uh, there is a grant for about 1.2 million dollars coming out of RCO this year. Um, Leslie and I are also planning to chase that grant to help fund that, which is why we're trying to get this plan wrapped up so we can say, yes, this is the plan. This is what's been adopted. These are the schedules and why we're moving forward with these grants. Um, we did provide some additional work in Cedar View because we think um, the, the backstop in the sports board with, with a lower cost pipe project that could provide a lot of benefit to that neighborhood. And at the bottom, you'll see the Reed property. Um, that's not really our construction of the Reed property, but that's our purchasing so it gets weird, and I know there's lots of debates about this, but our purchasing of the property from as a city go general government from the water utility so that it could be developed with park facilities at a later date in partnership with them above RC. So I think for us, I think we've, we've heard some great feedback on the parks and the grouping. Um, is there anything kind of on the project sequencing that's later in the sequencing that you would like to see earlier in the sequencing? Because um, this will, and when we get the next time, we'll kind of see how this is informing our next kind of step with the city council. Uh, Councilor McClellan. Yeah, so uh, we missed an opportunity to take a poll in the last election cycle. We could have put a, uh, a measure on the ballot to inform us, but we weren't ready. So, you know, I mean, it wouldn't have been a very good measure, but can we uh, prepare? a few um, uh, questions for the 2025 race, Bonnie Lake. We'll, we'll have people in that race, so the price for putting a few uh, measures on the ballot to get feedback from more than 1,800 people would be a bargain. And specifically, I think I'd like to see uh, a measure that said, would you bond for B and D? to pull it from 44 back to 26 or 28. About how much does that cost to be? Yeah, that's a for city administration on that. Yeah. I, I, I mean, hypothetically, uh, yeah. I, I don't know. I, I, could, I could look into that. Yeah. About what it would cost to put something on the ballot. Yeah, it seems to uh, yeah. be a valid question. Uh, uh, any any further commentary before we move on? Uh, I do. Oh, hey, uh, Councilmember Hoover. <laughs> Hi. Um, uh, so, I saw your hand. <laughs> <laughs> um, so some of my concerns in after, you know, being out there talking to the public and uh, stuff over the summer and being on the planning commission, the playground and spray, spray parks are almost more important than sports fields are at this point because parents don't have anywhere in our city for their kids to go and play. We have a very, very old park um, playground area at Cedar View, and we have a very minuscule park at Allen York Park. So considering that we need as a city to give our families more places to go out and play so that those of us that have younger kids aren't driving to to Holly to go play. 
So I think that playgrounds and spray parks and things need to come before sport fields and, you know, bike skills and things like that, because th those are very important for those younger families. Oh, I think it's a very valid point, Council Member Hoover. Thank you. Um, and we can provide feedback for that. Yes. Yeah, uh, I, I always say we did move up this the spray park in Newtown Park to be a 28 project. Yeah. Um, the only reason we put the sports field ahead of the spray park in Newtown Park was because of the grant opportunity. Okay. Uh, there's not an equal grant right now for that. And so we were kind of trying to the early ones have that early success by chasing grant funds. Uh, the reason that the spray park in Cedar View was moved out as far as it was is in order to build the spray park at Cedar View, we need to build the sewer system in the Cedar New York neighborhood, or at least part of the trunk line. And we lost it. And we lost those lines. Yeah. And so we've moved it out further to give us time to try to figure out how to deal with the infrastructure question. And then really the one in Allen York, the one in um, Allen York Park really requires us to have the road reconstruction done first. And so we felt like that was just something that's going to take a little bit more time to come together. And so trying to move that for project forward without that other project would just be difficult. So don't disagree uh, with you, uh, Council Member Hubler, but I think that's kind of the, at least the strategy was to try to get the one at Midtown Park at least going here in the next couple of years. And uh, Commissioner uh, Solomon had a comment. Yeah, uh, Thank you for raising your hand. During our sensing session during the summer, uh, Lions Club was very interested in the spray park. And they said apparently there's funding from the national organizations that support these things. Do we have grant opportunities for that? Do, do you know? We can look into it. Okay. Yeah, definitely. And, and yes, yeah, so if we can advance a project and get it because we've got grants, we would gladly, or partnerships with private organizations, we would gladly do that. So, all right. This is just assuming, not knowing all of it. Is that answer uh, some question? Member Swanman. Yeah, I was interested in what Mr. Roach was thinking over there about funding and not know if this is the point that we were talking about that in because you know some of these grants that we're talking about are minuscule basically. Mm. There's a lot of them out there. There's hundreds of thousands of dollars of grants out there. And they're just that's that's like a joke. You know, I could write a check today for a hundred thousand dollars and it would get you nothing. You know, when you're talking about these level of improvements, you're talking about multi millions of dollars. Many, 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 many. Yeah, yeah, the, the one so how are you going to generate that, right? Is the question. So, I, I, can I go to the next right. slide? And I think I can answer both of those questions simultaneously. Perfect. The grant that we're looking at for Midtown Park was $1.2 million. Uh, so, that we felt that that was a sizable enough. I don't remember what the grant for the boat facility was. Good luck getting that. What was the grant size we got for the whatever it was? Kind of arguably the twelve million dollar field we yeah, yeah. three hundred. Three fifty. Like I said, oh, that's that's not bad, right? Further, we're going to do our best, and I think the next step kind of gets to that question. Um, we want to make sure we had the projects grouped correctly, the timeline generally correct, knowing that there's some things that we might want to advance or not based on funding. The next thing that we're doing that was part of this package is we're going to be coming back, and this is what I promised the council when we did the initial contract, was we're going to bring back the costing and revenue together. Um, and that will allow the council to either kick projects out past that 25-year window if they want. It will, we're working with FCS group right now to identify, one, what the rate study is for parking impact fees, which is a critical component of this, and other revenue sources that are available to the city council. Um, and then the city council can make those choices and we can run that project. So I guess to get to your question, uh, Council Member Roach, is we're, we want to make sure that we had it grouped right, that we had the projects listed right, that we had the timing right, and then uh, Steve and FCS group will be coming back to do a presentation about here's the cost, here's the revenue you could get for park impact fees if you set them at different rates, um, and here are other funding sources that the council could uh, consider. I know at one time the council was considering vino tax for park improvements. Mm -hmm. uh, that's an option that's still on the table. Um, and so there are other funding sources out there. There's grants. What what kind of estimating timeline are we looking at to get the revenue uh, presentation? It will probably be in the next 30 to 45 days. Okay. Uh, because we want to have this adopted by April so that we're, re we're available to start chasing grants in, in the fall. Um, okay. So I hope that answers. Right, At least we're, when you're going to get the information. Okay. Councilmember Klein. Or 
the bond measure going to be part of that revenue? Yeah. It, it could. Do you honestly think that the public is going to vote for any kind of a park bond when they defeated the last one so significantly? Well, depends no, on timing. No, no, go. But no, but you know what? That's a significant data point for us, isn't it? Right. right? That we know that's the biggest poll that you can take and be definitive. No, Bonnie Lake citizens don't want to pay for a $15 million park. And Commissioner Saul. As I remember, uh, the people who moved that park going forward couldn't agree on what to build. So it was. It wasn't specific. It was a yeah. tax yeah. forever without buying it to pay. <clears throat> well, the solution would be here's what we're going to build, when we're going to build it, do you want to approve it? And then, and then right. the answer would clearly still be no. But in what, what's going to cost? What's the cost of putting down the measure in 2025? We're already going to have council members on the ballot. Yeah. So we'll have already paid that. What is the fee for putting? Very little. Yeah, I think it's like 2500 bucks, right? Yeah. So that's that's a cheap poll. How much did our but still you know, you're, in, in my opinion, you're asking them again. If they say yes or no, does that mean you're actually going to put it on there? Does, you know, that where's the group at that's going to push that forward? And if that's going to be approved, it's going to be X number of years down the road. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, and uh, Commissioner Bain. So, I mean, getting back to what we were talking about before, like, there was no plan. And for me, as a citizen, I don't want to have a lead check saying, I'm not sure what you're going to do. We're here. This is the whole point of the park's plan is to get a plan and say, hey, this is what we want to do. This is what you told us you want to do. And if we look back at the side of the beginning, they are really supportive of this happening. So since they have input, we've kind of all gone through it and we have a plan saying, hey, this is what we want to pay for. If you, you want to pay for it now, it has a lot higher chance of going through than just a blank check saying, yeah, we'll do something. And people's attitudes have changed since COVID and yeah. there's been a whole bunch of global activities that have happened. And this, might get a little this bit whole summer, we've been result. canvassing people yeah. and talking and in their state is it. like right now pushing to eliminate the 1% cap on property taxes. I don't know if you've looked at your property taxes lately, but each one of those probably pays many, many, many thousands of dollars a year in property taxes alone. The concept of somebody else going to wanting to up that tax bill is probably extraordinarily small. If you had a group of people here today that were sitting in the audience with shirts on that say more parks for Bonnie Lakes and they were going to go out there and run for that and try to get it done, you might have something to work with. You had that before. It got soundly defeated by an extraordinarily amount of like, margin. And how long ago was that? Set the state record, 2013. 2013? So we're talking 11 years ago? Did this have to come from Wasn't that... The initiative that got defeated uh, that was for municipalities for municipal parks municipal park districts yeah. were a large right, right. Or, no, so right. um but i think by if we can come up with a clear value of how much we want these we want to spend on each park and then we can give them an exact number and even possibly break down how much that would cost in their taxes. How long is this going to last? 25 years from now, this is going to drop off and you're done or, you know, whatever it may be. It, it possibly could have a, a way to pass. So and, get and, and that's hashing out just one revenue source. As well. Yeah. Uh, so did you oh, thank you. Uh, City Clark got something to say. Yes. Um, I did look up for the ballot measure just to answer Mr. McClendon's question. Um, they can't give an estimate because it is based on how many jurisdictions and how many voters participate. So you don't find out until after. How much you're Oh, that's what. Um, how much does it typically cost us for an election? Do we know that? I mean, we just had an election. Between 50 and 100,000? It's, Sherry here. It's about 50,000. And uh, quickly, I also want to add that you have the opportunity to do council manic bonds. This doesn't have to be public approved. Well, so, uh, the, the, yeah, the general thought being is that there's several ways to approach this. It's Correct. not just the ability to do it. Yeah. And, and I would add, uh, 
the same thing as Dave, like what you're talking about is that there was no plan. Uh, that was kind of the same reason we decided to table the P&O tax. It was like, hey, we don't really have a plan on what we're doing. And we're going to tax people or business or anything, but we're not sure what yet. Once we have a plan, now we're heading at least in the right direction, I think, which is a positive for us. To there were plans before. So clearly, there were many, many plans. Were, and, and, a lot, lot of very similar to this. Sure. They were probably in smaller bikes. Yeah, older plans that newer council members didn't necessarily want to go on. Right. There you go. Yeah, and there uh, you go. the council member problem. Well, wasn't it even in the 2013 election that it was it was voting to basically create a new park district? Yeah, right. right. Yeah. And I, I would vote against that as right. a as a final voter. And so, yeah. And this commission of in that. All right, I, and I, I love the ro robust discussion at 716, and uh, Debbie Mercar had a very valid point about the weather that's, uh, uh, that we have out there that might be getting set about 7 o'clock, so uh, we have to keep in mind that as well. So before we move on, are we ready to move on? I just want to throw that out to the council. And I, and I would say if there's anybody, if there's anybody on the council with a bank question has additional conversations they want to have or... I express different things. Please reach out to me. We are not done. This is just a step in the process. And we'll gladly keep working at it until we come up with I think something the council can support. I don't know what that looks like, but we'll get there. Okay. I believe we are ready now to end the joint city council workshop and planning commission. Oh, we've got one more item. One more item. We have that on my agenda. Yeah. We can table that for now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> trying to do this. <laughs> All right. So we have one more item. Council member Allen, you were with the commission for a long time. <laughs> and <laughs> as a traditional, <laughs> when a commissioner moves on to the city oh. council, <laughs> we give them the best we're going away with. <laughs> but we will get uh. to I love you guys and I will miss you, but I'll come see you still. I promise. <laughs> oh, that's what I oh, okay. And uh, apparently I jumped the gun and I don't want to do that again. <laughs> so, um, do we have any more further business? Uh, planning commission? Yeah, there's another, there's another presentation. Oh, okay. Uh, all right. And what do we have? Okay. Just waiting for this. Okay. Yeah. Not, not quite yet. Yeah. You not need to exit? Yep. Thank you. There we go. Now we can go. So, I just put a The other one. One, two, three, four. Clear, not yours. Right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know that it's been a long night and we've got weather, but we do have some death. This one is kind of deadline sensitive because we have to be done by the end of the year uh, and we are really behind the eight ball on this project so we did need to get this kind of kicked off with the city council to make sure that we are at least pointing in the right direction lots more to come but we are wanting to be sure that we're pointing in the right direction um so that we at least start off on a good foot so um we are in the process of updating our comprehensive plan we're doing the required periodic update um that is required by state law um this is an update that the city is required to do under the Growth Management Act and have completed by December 31st of 2024. We always get the question of why we have to do this. Not doing this makes us, make, makes us not eligible for grants if we're not certified by the Puget Sound Regional Council and updated our comprehensive plan and submitted to Commerce. There's also other sanctions that the governor's office can place on cities who refuse to update their comprehensive plan. So there are financial implications from not updating your comprehensive plan. So it is very important. Um, that we do it. And you said the deadline is the end of the year. The end of the year. Okay. Um, and, and we're kind of in a, in a very, I don't want to say tough situation, but we have lots of people 
outside of the city telling us the things that we have to do. So we've got the Growth Management Act, which is adopted by the state legislature, which has a number of requirements that we have to include in our, in our comprehensive plan. Um, we also have Vision 2050, uh, which is adopted by the Puget Sound Regional Council, which we are part of. Um, but it is a multi-county body that includes countywide planning policies that we have to meet. And also the countywide planning policies that are adopted by the Pierce County uh, Regional Council and also Pierce County, uh, which is why it's important to have people serving on those bodies as well. And in our local comprehensive plan. Um, so that's kind of the the political the 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 framework in which we're working under the, the requirements we need to meet to update our comprehensive plan. Why are, the other reason we update the comprehensive plan is because it directs and guides the work that we do as staff over that 10 year, that at least that first 10 year horizon. Um, it provides kind of our compass of where we should be working and putting our efforts, um, guiding how we do capital planning, how we do budget planning, how we do development code writing. The comprehensive plan is kind of our first step. And so again, getting the council's policy direction built into that along with the community's policy direction is really critical for all the work we're going to do over the next 10 years. Um, so what are the repercussions for not following elements of the 2050? So if we don't comply and get certified with the Puget Sound Regional Council, we would not be available for any funding source, any funding that's coming through the Puget Sound Regional Council. Currently, we will receive the half a million dollar grant due to the design work on some transportation improvements. We would lose that grant. Um, we're also getting a loan through the uh, water result revolving fund. I don't know how that happens if we automatically stop having client comp plan from the Department of Commerce. Um, for any state funding, revolving loans, TIB, uh, RCL, what is TIB? Uh, transportation improvement. Okay. Board, um, you have to have comprehensive plan that has basically been approved and, and adopted by the Department of Commerce and meeting the federal requirements. Uh, additionally, if you just say we're not going to do it, um, there are other uh, sanctions that can be placed on cities, which includes taking away the city's portion of the state revenue sharing from like uh, liquor tax, gas tax. Um, also, it, it can impact our ability to collect read money. So there are real financial implications. And I believe the city of Chelan or the county of Chelan was the last one. They have actually faced sanctions about 20 years ago for refusing to do their comprehensive plan. Um, so there are real financial implications. That being said, it's, yeah. So what I heard, correct me if I'm an active listener here, if there's an element of the 2050 plan that we disagree with, It'll cost us about five hundred thousand. No, it costs us significantly more. That was just one grant. So all the grants that we were talking about chasing, all of the money we want to chase for road funding, all grants and loans that we would get to the state of Washington would not be available to the city. So the state of Washington is enforcing the 2050 plan. They are enforcing our compliance with the growth management. Yeah, I didn't ask about GMA. I asked about the Puget Sound Regional Council. Oh, that's the 2050 plan. The the Division 2050 would be any transportation funding that we get through PSRC. I will say most of the how's it the more controversial requirements in my mind are coming through the Growth Management Act requirements, yeah. not through the Division 2050 requirements. Most of the requirements that are coming through Vision 2050, we're pre we're feeling pretty good about. I think as we walk through this presentation, you'll see what I mean by, I, I, I think I think when we get to the end of the day, I don't think that PSRC is going to be where most of our tough issues are. I think it's going to be more through the growth management side. Okay. Um, so what we know as we do this comprehensive plan update is that we're going to continue to grow. We're, that we're going to continue to diversify in both our social political identities, language, income levels, will continue to increase. Uh, Bonnie Lake will continue to grow. Uh, the question is how much and where are the key questions, and that's really a policy discussion. Um, we must include options um, that lead to access to housing, employment, and transportation. Uh, and we do know that city government, the community, and the business will need to collaborate around shared values and goals. So yes, there are real state requirements. They provide a framework. How we meet those are two ways. 
you can go down the path that everybody goes down, or you can get creative and try to figure out how to achieve what the community is wanting in a way that still meets the growth management act goal. And that's been our charge. So what we do now is that the comprehensive plan will talk about housing and development. It's going to need to talk about parks, which we were talking about tonight, uh, equity, environment and climate and transportation and economics. Those are the broad topics um, that we want to talk that are going to be discussed in there. And when we talk about equity and comprehensive planning, the vision I want people to have in their mind is it's about access to public and in public infrastructure and improvements. For example, the most simplest one I can use is a crosswalk. When someone walks up to a crosswalk, we design those to be equitably used, which means for people who are blind, there's audio signals saying walk or do not walk. For people who are in wheelchairs or families with strollers, there are curb ramps. And for the blind, that there's little yellow dimples in the, in the curb ramp so that all users can use it. So when we're talking about equity and comprehensive plan, what we're really talking about is how do you design our system so that regardless of your life, you're able to interact with that system. So yeah, think, your equity on your crosswalks has ADA requirements. Those are yes, all yeah. 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 right, but that's a part of equity. I think that we just use that as the most kind of classic example because people can wrap their head about coming to a possible that's, that's a very objective standard though for a sidewalk an engineering standard an ADM standard as opposed to a subjective like can you get to work from your house or something. I, I, I I don't disagree and then, and then parks is an alt is a optional thing right right but one thing we've learned through our surveys is that parks trails and open space the fact we're doing the plan are very important to the community really? yes it is an optional element for the comprehensive plan so we don't have to have a parks element, but we're doing the parks plan anyway, so it's going to be part and parcel adopted by reference in the comprehensive plan because it's part of what the community. So those other ones are required, though. Sure. Uh, the ones that are the ones that aren't here that are not required are economics and parks. Those are both optional elements. All right. So we did run a survey um, between October 13th and January 17th. We pushed it out through social media. We pushed it out through community events. Not meant to be a statistically valid survey. It was we pushed out through meeting with different organizations through Facebook. We put mailers in, uh, in utility billing. It's not meant to be a statistically valid survey. It's meant to give us a guiding framework. And I think the council will not disagree with the guiding framework that came back from the survey. We asked people what their top three priorities <laughs> over the next 25 years would be. I'm not surprised. Um, it would be reducing traffic congestion, which I think is the hardest one for us because a lot of the traffic congestion we receive is from Tahale, Buckley, unincorporated Pierce County, and our ability to manage that is difficult because we're not the regulating agency. I don't know. Mr. Johnstone assured me that just synchronizing the stoplights were going to help that traffic. <laughs> Not fixed. <laughs> so we had a, a survey that we did here, you know, and it clearly says that the people said that reducing traffic congestion was the number one priority, right? Yep. And we and yet we just had a park survey that we said the number one was whatever, and we we're going to do that number one. But over here, you're well, we were we we're going to say that you know we're not going to work on no. We were trying to say in the broad frame of comprehensive, but we, as you can see, we didn't put parks on there because we were running it on a separate track. Um, we were trying to ask people of these issues outside of parks, what are the priorities? Yeah, the problem is with the traffic congestion, in my opinion, that the vast majority of people don't understand the concept of that. You know, that's my opinion. Political, you know, you guys are staff, you have to do the stats. But the problem is why you get that out there is because you, we could do that. We could, you know, eliminate traffic congestion in the city of Bonnie Lake. Easy enough, you know, well within the power of the legislative branch. If you do absolutely anything else, probably not. <laughs> Cost prohibitive, I guess is what I'm saying. Yes, you could in theory make four, ten, and eight lane roads <laughs> right to the end of the city and then have problems. Spend the billions all the time. I don't I, I guess for us it was just we were trying to figure out um, what's on people's minds, right? Like this is a this isn't a policy direction. It's a what are people concerned about? What are they seeing in their community that as we prepare these plans they want us to focus on? But Traffic how, how are we gonna focus on that though? There's, there are ways, right? tra tra the way we do our transportation modeling, the way we lay out our zoning codes. There are things, the way we are actively participating on things. 
we weren't trying to get into the solutions tonight. We were just trying to say, as we set our true north compass for this update, where are we going to be the majority of our resources and efforts? It's going to be how do we look at traffic congestion, single family neighborhoods, building the bike and walk that goes right along with what we saw in the trail survey as, as trail becoming the highest thing. Uh, you see the next tier was public transportation, inclusivity, economic development. And then the bottom tier was environment, history, affordable housing, and perhaps historical preservation. We're going to focus on all of these, but that's what the community is on the top of their mind. If you ask me right now, these are the issues that they're seeing day to day, and we wanted to reflect that. We also asked people to just tell us what Vine looks like in 2049. Um, and I'm not seeing a lot of things that are different from what we've heard. Um, they would like us to have a slower growth rate, have a small town feel. Um, they want some tree protection, uh, less traffic. So these are not meant to be policy. As I keep saying, they're not meant to be, this is the policy. This is meant to say, this is what people, data points, as I think uh, Councilman Bergman Climbins like to say, these are data points of what are people are on people's mind, and it needs to be on staff's mind as we prepare policy, as we do modeling, as we pro provide policy to the council. We also ask kind of how do we increase home ownership, right? What what different housing options would you support? Um, and as you can see, single family support high, and I'm not surprised. Um, but also townhomes and cottages support came in kind of second and third. So it's in how do as we set policy, as we look at our zoning. How do we help support development of cottages and townhomes that provide a lower cost point for home ownership? And comply with the growth management. And comply with growth management. Right. So we were trying to find out how do we find those housing types that work for the community, but also meet those state and federal. Yeah, we don't know what the scale looks like here, though, so this is going to be kind of weird. And you what? You have, you know, 9,000 people saying single family and 12. And the, re and the reason we did put the percentages on it, because they won't act on 100%, because you can select all the ones. So one person could have select yes for everyone, or they could have selected one. So once again, we're trying this. That's why I said it's not a statistically valid survey. It is a what? What are the trends we are seeing as a trend line? The, the trend lines are not far from what we expected, which is which is good. It was a way to kind of test some theories we have. Um, and the same with transportation improvements, sidewalks, crosswalks. As, as Steve was saying, we're seeing a lot of correlation between what we're hearing and the trail. Of wanting people to walk and wanting people to have ability to walk. Um, we're seeing the same thing here that trails, walking, improving signals are kind of on the top of people's minds as we talked about transportation outside of fixing the traffic. This was the one that we were most interested to see what would happen. And no, we didn't give you percentages because when we're, once again, we're just looking at the order of magnitude. We asked people where they would support residential development in the city. And overwhelmingly, they've picked area E and area C, which is the Scott Island neighborhood, and area B, which is kind of the downtown. Are, is all of that south of 410? Or, oh, no, you said uh, area B. Area yeah. B is north of 410. Okay. We think that C and B kind of got some double votes because the downtown splits both sides of 410. Um, so one thing, if we could have done it better, we would have split that area out a little bit better. But... We also can see that people really are trying to limit the future growth in areas A and D. Once again, trend lines, what's on people's mind, what are the public telling us? So that's how we're going into this next part of the presentation. Understanding what people are saying, what they want, slow growth, less traffic congestion, and also our requirements under the Growth Management Act and um, the Pierce County or the Pierce County Regional Council. And I will say this, Council of Requirements, one of the things I think that's different between the Growth Management Act and Vision 2050 is for us, at least here in the city, um, Vision 2050 actually expects the city of Violet to slow its growth. Um, the Puget Sound Regional Council stance is that the higher density housing, the real large population increases should occur around heavy rail, light rail, or bus BRT not just out in every city. The Growth Management Act looks at Seattle, Buckley, Wilkinson, and Barney Lake identically. There are no differentiation in those sizes of communities. So that's why I said, I think the Puget Sound Regional Council policies are a little bit more in line with how we see the growth going, and then trying to fit in with some of the requirements that we have from the Department of Commerce. 
So with that being said, and then I will wrap it up. And this, I think, is the part where we need to some feedback from the council uh, on the end. Let me get to the last slide because I know this is about to be controversial. So let me get to the last slide and then I will take everything and just give me some direction. So both the Puget Sound Regional Council sets growth targets for the city and so now does the Department of Commerce. The Puget Sound Regional Council treats their growth targets for our geography as a ceiling that we should not grow above. The Department of Commerce treats it as a capacity number that we have to have a minimum number of. So they're a little bit different in their application. We have to be able to show consistency with both. So the growth targets that Puget Sound Regional Council established are based on what they call regional geographies. And it divides up the Puget Sound region into a number of different geographies from metropolitan cities all the way down to cities and towns in the urban unincorporated. We are in the cities and towns category. Under the regional growth strategy, we are to take less growth over time and have that growth occur in the metropolitan cities, high capacity transit communities and core cities. For example, the city of Sumner, while they are currently having lower population than the city of Wyoming, Lake, is required to take significantly more population growth than we are because of the link, because of the light rail station. So there is a whether we agree with it or don't agree with, that's the thought process behind the regional growth strategy. So it was negotiated two years ago when Vision 2050 was adopted. Mm -hmm. um, the Puget Sound Regional Council did set a target specifically for the city. It set a target for all the cities and towns in Pierce County. Pierce County, in consultation with the city staff, worked on targets for each of the cities and towns in Pierce County, which include Bonnie Lake, Buckley, Wilkinson, South Prairie, Edgewood, and I might miss one, but those were the main ones. Um, everybody else had their own categories and they were working through it. So that came through Pierce County in negotiation with the city. The Department of Commerce, due to some legislation change two years ago, for the first time established housing targets for the city. In the past, targets were based on total number of housing units. You need to have 1,500 housing units. You need to have 30,000 housing units. It didn't look at how affordable or what those housing units cost. Due to changes in state law, the state legislature empowered commerce to establish housing targets for us based on income band. So you have to have enough housing affordable to these different income bands as they list here, zero to 30, and PSA is just permanent supportive housing, zero to 30, non-permanent supportive housing, 30 to 50, 50 to 80, 80 to 120, and 120 and above. So we have to show that we have capacity for all of those different housing types. And as you can see, as you move down the affordability index, it moves from single family to higher density. So that is the requirement of the state. The state took our population number and our housing target and assigned us income value based on those targets. So here is the way it works with just the overall targets. And the reason that we didn't put population all the way out is because that just kind of runs with housing and there's not really a developed regulation tied to population, but there are to jobs and housing units. So our, our 2044 growth target, and that's where we'll measure, measure compliance, is 1,450 housing units. However, that was based on the number of housing units and our perfected growth from 2020. So any growth that occurred between 2020 and 2023 is subtracted from that 1,450 housing units because the base year of that is 2020. We had about 682 housing units. Um, we have about seven, we have 7,680 housing uh, unit target left between now and 44. 2049, because we're rolling the comp plan out, we straight lined it. So our order of compliance is 44. Based on our pipeline capacity, we have 828 housing units, 846 in zone capacity, giving us a negative number of 998, which means we have excess capacity of about 1,000. On job, we have about excess capacity of 1,100, which means we have more capacity in the city than we need to meet our housing targets. This becomes a point at which the council can make legislative decisions. We're planning all of our road planning, street planning, sewer planning, 
parts planning is based on achieving our, our targets. So the higher you are above the targets, there's more capacity, there's more housing and development that could occur above your target, creating problems between what you're planning for building and what actually occurs. So there is the ability for the council to have some legislative change in that area to kind of deal with how we deal with that excess capacity. Do we increase it? Do we lower it? That is some legislative decisions the council gets to make. I, um, so the last two slides were a bit confusing. To be honest, okay, so where would you go back to? Um, this this is, first of all, it's it, I have my contact lenses in, and I can't see most of those books. That's okay. first. Um, but secondly, I am looking at this like chart on the right hand side, attempting to understand it, and I just can't. I have looked at it, and looked, I don't know what. So data is displaying. So what it's displaying? This is from the Department of Commerce's website. Okay. And statewide, in the next 20 years, the state needs to add 1.1 million homes over the next 20 years. Okay, across I, the I state, understand that. Across the state. Okay. In the colored bars above uh -huh. are the number of housing units we have to add that are affordable to those different areas. Okay, so with statewide, you have to add 310,000 single family homes. Yes. You have to add 200. Well, no, we have to add 310,000 homes that are affordable to those making 120% of the area median income. To be able to afford a single family home. Those are, that's, the, that's how they're saying, that's their proxy for determining capacity. Okay. That most people who are making 120% of the area median income can buy single family homes. Below that, it gets harder. So the next bracket is those making between kind of in the orange brown is those making between 50 and 120 percent of the area median okay, income. Yes, I'm and that's where they start talking about that middle housing, the multiplexes being affordable to that. Is that why those pictures are above it because it's yes. that's what they can afford? As a proxy, oh. right? Like if you go down to downtown Seattle, condo is significantly more expensive than right. a condo. Well, so we're trying; they're, they're trying to establish ways for us to demonstrate compliance. Okay. And that is the proxy that they are using. But then uh, on the next slide, you say um, for housing units, this is just for Bonnie Lake. Is that what you're? This is saying? just Bonnie Lake. Stuff. Okay. So in the 2044 growth target, where you have 1,450 units, you're saying we have to meet that that number. Is that and that's counting from now until 2044, correct? Correct. But aren't we already adding that with Tarragon alone? So Tarragon is 682 housing. So then he didn't subtract, but that would count towards that. Number. That's in the pipeline capacity. Per the current development agreement, the limit was 670-ish. I used to have it memorized, and I apologize. I don't have the exact point. But that is considered in that pipeline capacity under the current development agreement. So pipeline capacity is all the projects that we currently have been permitting that have not yet been built. Right, and that's why you're how you're equating these the negative numbers at the end. Correct. So the target is what we have to meet. The the 2020 2023 is growth that has already occurred, right? Mm -hmm. So units that we built between 2020 and 2023 that were not in existence when we set the target back in 2020. That leaves your remaining target of 768 housing units between today and 2044, we have 828 in pipeline capacity, which would include the Tarragon project and other developments that we have in the city. We have a zone capacity for 846 additional housing units plus the ADUs, um, which give, means that we have excess capacity of about a thousand housing units overall. So that's what I'm saying so from a PSRC type standpoint, we're meeting their requirements. Gotcha. Okay. Now, before we move on, can you share with us how many Bonnie Lake representatives are on the Puget Sound Regional Council? So the way the Puget Sound Regional Council works is it elects the representative that serves Pierce County through the Pierce County Regional Council. So there's one rep that represents the cities and towns in Pierce County. And I believe currently that person that was chosen by the people who serve on PCRC, which I think was Justin Evans and Councilman Bolton. And now, and now Council Member Roach. Roach and would have been also Councilmember Hulu. Yes, they're on the P 
Pierce County Regional Council. Pierce County. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, and I'm talking about the Puget Sound. And they, and they select the representative that goes up to the Puget Sound Regional Council. Okay. And so, do we have? And so my question is, do we have anybody that was was Council Member Evans when he was there? Was he on the Puget Sound Regional Council? He was a He did. When? He, when we did it in 2015, when we did the plan update. What about in the 2020s to 2023? We yeah. had any representation? We, well, it depends. There was no one from the city that was. Let me, let me take a second. There was no one from the city that chose to throw their name in the hat mm -hmm. at the Pierce County. Well, I'm not, I'm not asking the reason. I'm asking the number. Right. How many do we have? One. And who is that? Myself. And I on see. the Puget Sound Regional. I serve on the Puget Sound Regional Staff Committee. I'm the co-chair of the Puget Sound Regional Staff Committee. Okay. And so that's what I want. Yeah. We don't have the elected officials up there, but I am active in that organization um, and, and one of the co-chairs uh, of the Regional Staff Committee. So that's all the planning directors and planning officials throughout the region. Okay. So we do have representation just not on the elected side. Okay. Yeah, and that's what I wanted to know. I'm sorry. I didn't understand. I didn't understand. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, so, 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 does the county have a representative that is on it? Pierce County. They have a representative. They get to send directly. And I believe it's Bruce Gamire as the executive. Okay. And then they can. The county can also send a representative um, from the county council to the growth management policy board. And then they have a staff planner that can be on it. Um, and right now that chair is empty. The staff people that are serving up there are myself. Um, Tiffany Sanders from Lakewood and then Kendall Walls from Tulane. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, and just so everybody understands, uh, the Puget Sound Regional Council typically has gone the King County's direction, right? So the Pierce County does have representation, but it is small. And so Pierce County typically gets run over as a best body lake. Yeah, I asked smaller than Pierce County. So and the reason why I have, 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 yeah, have a particular uh, and I'm sorry to talk over, but uh, flashbacks of the Pima comments that I went to uh, uh, back in May and coming in and so suffering so a little bit of PTSD uh, because of that. But what what you mentioned is a very valid point in the fact that Bonnie Lake and Wilkinson and um, uh, Prairie Ridge were all considered the same on this council. Yeah. And in other words, we're thought of kind of as an afterthought. Well, they get to it's it's the same where it's like in King County too. The smaller city, there's there's so many seats that get sent up. Like the county, the county gets a seat. Tacoma gets a seat. Mm -hmm. Then there's a seat for the large cities. Um, so the large cities like Puyallup, uh, University Place, they select a representative to send up there. Right. And then a representative is sent up from the small cities and towns group. And for about four years, that was Council Member Evans representing both Bonnie Lake, but also yeah. all the small towns and cities in Pierce County. And the, not to belabor the point, because, uh, the, and I've been doing this for the past two years, but the, but the thing about it is that people are assuming that we are a city of 20,000, when we're more than that, we're significantly more than that. Um, it, we're, we're, well on the way to becoming over 25,000 and we're well on the way to getting to that 30,000 uh, mark to where we're going to be in, uh, put into a different category um, as far as what they consider. But right now we're not. I don't think we'll ever move out of our category under the current strategy. And mm -hmm. the reason is, is because to move out of the cities and towns category, the one thing that we're going to have to have about population, tramp, it's a tramp. Mm -hmm. We will have to have either BRT, light rail, or heavy rail to move up because that's the next. That's their, as I said, PSRC's driving issue. They kind of how they differentiate, yeah. not just population. And, 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 and that is theoretical, but that's not what's happening. People are moving up here without the light rail. I, I'm just explaining how the, the governmental structure is set up. So, what do we do about getting them to recognize that? that people are moving up here without us having public transportation. I, I think the way that they're recognizing it is, is their policy direction to us is we need to slow our growth rate and push that growth. So we're telling people not to buy here because we have to slow our growth rate. That's a little, that that's not realistic. Well, I, it, it's, it's, 
It's possible. It's like, I'm sorry, I can't sell you this house because well, you can't no, sell regional, but Ken Council says we have to slower growth. No, it's more of how we set up our zoning structure and how we set up. So, for example, do we zone all our single family zones to 12 units per acre? Mm -hmm. Or do we keep it at four to five? Or do we lower it? Mm -hmm. Right? That's going to affect your growth rate, not whether someone's selling or buying a house. It's does the council as a legislative body mm -hmm. want to say all single family residential zones disappear and they're all multifamily zones? And so we want 20 units per acre. And we're talking about just in the Bonnie Lake City limits. Bonnie Lake City limits. And do we not have a lot of unincorporated Pierce County basically within Bonnie Lake City limits? No, there's no unincorporated. I mean, the, the way that our city limits look is kind of like gerrymandering. You can go block to block, and we can yeah, be. Kelly Farms is not Pierce County. Yeah, Kelly, yeah, no, Kelly Farms is not. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it, but it. What it, my my point being, that as a legislative body here, say hypothetically, that the county is look or that the uh, city council is looking to annex some of these properties to bring in, like Brody Park, which I don't think is in our city limits. Yeah, that's correct. That's not. And how many people live in Brody Park? 575. Yeah, I, 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 I don't. <laughs> and then and then we have uh, over there by 320, like Liberty Ridge is not within the the city limits. However, it's kind of thought of it as as Bonnie Lake and whatever may happen in the future, we may legislatively increase our population significantly. And those are two, I guess those are two different dynamics of how we look at population. Mm -hmm. Increasing population of the people that are already here near the city limits versus new development on existing property. So those are kind of two different analyses. And we also have to look at what's urban and rural. So like Liberty Ridge, uh, Prairie Ridge, those areas can never be annexed into the city because they're unincorporated in rural Pierce County. Why Pierce County did that? I cannot answer, but we can't annex it. Uh, the thumb, we can't can, annex Can you show me that statute? Yes, the growth management. Act. You can only annex property within the urban growth. Some, some, you know. I can get, I, can, I don't have the, the exact. No, I'm not asking you to specific sign. I mean, later on, can you send me what you're referring to? I'm sending it to me by email. Yeah, there's a there's a specific statute that says in order to annex areas, it has to be in the urban growth area. Okay, and, and that's what I'm asking. Yeah, and we cannot establish the urban growth area. The urban growth area has to be established by Pierce County. Okay. Um, which is like the thumb we can't annex because it's actually rural agricultural resource lands. So See, that, that kind of steers my conversations with uh, with Mr. Dammer when you know when we talk about this sort of thing because we have, and um, and so that and I'm just wondering, uh, yeah. you know, about uh, you know what I'm limited with and what I can uh, and what I can speak with about. Yeah. So one of the things we're working, and I can I will gladly send you that that ordinance that okay. that like oh. Can I can I say something? I, I really feel like we need to move on. This feels like a separate conversation that should be had at the 750. No, I do agree with okay. Councilman Paul. Uh, with Councilman Paul, we can okay. table this for a for a different conversation. Okay. How much how much right. more right. Press, press slides? And the last one is what I really need to direct. Okay. The statute RCW 35A 14005. No code city located in a county in which urban growth areas have been designated under RCW 3678 110. That's in the GMA, they ask territory beyond an urban Oh, right. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. Okay, you're um, relieved of that duty. <laughs> okay, let's move on. So this, I think, is the one where we're going to have the most cost, yeah. the most issue, and that is the, the growth targets by income bands. And that's why I'm saying, let me get to this, because I think this is where we have the biggest challenge. So they took our 1,400 housing units that we have to add and broke it down by income band. So we have to show when we adopt our comprehensive plan that we have capacity for 456 housing units that are affordable to those making less than 50% of the area median income. And in Pierce County, that is about $60-something thousand, $68,000. <laughs> and we have to have about 253 housing units for that that's considered permanent supportive housing for those making zero 300 percent. 
We do not have to build them. We have to show that we have the zoned capacity using their proxy of density. And there's a couple ways we can do that. As you can see from this, when we take our current zoning capacity, our pipeline projects, we have more than enough capacity above 50% AMI in all the categories. Okay. One nice thing about the view by vintage was it was built after 2020, and all of those units are 60% in AMI or less, so that meets our requirement for the 50 to 80% AMI. So that's why we're really looking at the 50% or less area median income. So it's not just building apartments at market rate because those aren't affordable to zero to 30%, yeah. right? Yeah. I looked at rents in Bonnie Lake, they are currently more than my mortgage. So oh, yeah. market rate apartments don't necessarily just solve the problem. Uh, this is, I think, how the council member oh. Roach has a question. Oh, well, you might be answering that, but the, so you just said the zero to 30% we don't need to worry about because they're already being no, the, the, the 50 to 80. Yeah. Okay. The so, here's my question on zero to 30. Yeah, how do we, how do you get there? Is that, is that just section eight? Mm -hmm. it, 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 there's a lot of different strategies. Or middle income housing? Middle income. Well, when you get down to this level, you're really talking about other strategies. Okay. And that's what I was saying is I'll, on the next slide, I'll kind of get to those kind of two ways you can do it. Okay. And I just wanted to kind of give the council kind of how we're approaching this problem to see how the council wants us to look at it. Okay. So as part of our comprehensive plan, we're going to be looking at three alternatives that are going to inform our environmental impact statement analysis um, and also kind of the future land use map and zoning map that we bring back to the council at the end of the year. Many more conversations to have here. These are, if you went bowling, these are our sideboards that we're going to be using. So if you don't like the sideboards, please <laughs> let me know tonight because this is going to set what we do. So we to be better. <laughs> um, not that you're happy about it, but these are the sideboards and we can be anywhere between these sideboards. So the no action alternative we always have, which is just our current zoning, we know it doesn't work um, because it provides insufficient capacity for the income bands. So we know we have to have an alternative. We've developed two alternatives. One of them is stay the course. And that under that alternative, we would implement all the up zones that are currently envisioned in the currently adopted by the comprehensive plan. There was a number of up zones that were um, advocated for back in 2015 that we placed in the comprehensive plan that have not been acted. We would just enact all of those. Um, it would provide significantly more capacity than we need, which creates its problem from streets and planning and the other park plan, capital improvement planning items. And I think it's inconsistent with those roadmaps that we are getting from the, the, the survey. It would likely provide sufficient capacity for income bands because we can show we have capacity in those higher density categories, not guarantee that we can get the units, which creates problems in the future. Because in 10 years, we're going to have to do this again. And if we all that area we zoned for high density housing got built with market rate housing, we would still have the same income band and it would get the areas that we would have to work with become narrower and narrower. Alternative two is working within the Puget Sound Regional's concept of bending the trend to slow the overall growth rate of the city to a slower rate. Under that, we would do some targeted down zone to reduce our overall capacity because that's the way we can address, we can address transportation and some of those guiding principles that we saw from the, the community with slower growth, small community, keeping neighborhoods closer. We would focus that growth in the downtown center, um, which, is a, which is a countywide growth center, mm -hmm. um, the prime area for that, in which we have to have these conversations with council that we'd be evaluating is the old, all the property that the city bought over here for a future city hall building. There's an option there to be able to provide housing on that, which is closer to transit in the downtown center um, and work with a private developer to be able to. Residential on top and perhaps businesses on the bottom. Correct. OK. Uh, and also looking at how we develop housing in Midtown. Under the been the trend, we would reduce um, the allowed maximum density and our higher density zones like R3 downtown commercial, uh, downtown mixed use, but we would inject a density bonus if you provide housing that's affordable in those affordable housing groups. So to get to the higher density, you would have to show that you're providing at a certain ratio, one to two, two to one, specifics are still being worked out. So like what they did in Zalchan. 
I, on 38th and Portland Avenue. I don't. I think that was all Section 8 housing. Are, are you sure? I, I'm not 100% sure. I, can I look feel in. like it's mixed. It could be mixed, but yeah, some sort of a. If, I guess if you would guarantee to build a mixed income housing project, we would give you more density to offset that cost. The nice thing about the the upside about that is we would limit those density bonuses until we hit our in our targets that the Department of Commerce has set. So once we get to X number of units, we can remove those those the density bonuses because we've met our requirements and we broke manager. So are we saying we can allow businesses to add up so that they could put like an apartment complex on top of a business? Yes. Or if you're in a zone that allows say 12 units per acre, we'll let you go to 24 units per acre in the downtown and midtown area, provided that you're providing that housing that's affordable to those lower income groups. But if you're building in today's dollar, there's no way that you can provide affordable housing because it's going to cost you a million dollars just to build a house right now. Well, that's why that's why most of these were not in the city of family homes. They would be in those. I guess these are the strategies. Yeah. Either we can just upzone everything and say we got more than enough capacity and we hope it works, or we can do targeted area selection where we're going to drive that market and allow for that to, to force that housing to be constructed. So, Remind me again what the PSH stands for again. That was the zero. Permanent supportive housing. Is that section eight? Not necessarily. But it is, it is subsidized it, housing. It, it is subsidized by some groups. So okay. what includes what's included in permanent supportive housing? Yeah, what yeah so well, no. what's included in permanent supportive housing is people who run housing for abused women. Gotcha. Okay. When they want to flee, they'll have a house that that organization runs yes. that they can put up women fleeing abuse. Uh, okay. Disabled vets who they're trying to transition back. Right. We're dealing okay. with PTSD. So it's There's not. Many options. Yeah, it's not. Yes. That's why I keep saying about foster families. Foster families or families facing homelessness. There are all these different advocacy groups that they they basically build what they call supportive housing to help people transition from edge of homelessness or domestic violence or other things back into normal housing. That's what they call why they call it supportive housing. Okay. It's not just Section Eight. It's exactly. that's why I'm saying it's. Yeah, yeah. It's subsidized, yeah. It has to be subsidized. It's subsidized, but it's not just for low income. It could be disabled bats. Sure. Yeah. They all have their different little kind of groups that they're trying to help provide housing for. So it, it fluctuates. Um, and then we would also, like I said, by under the bend of train, it would ensure it would look to ensure that we don't use up capacity without adding those housing units. So those are the kind of the sideboards we're looking at. How's it, how's it a sideboard though? It's kind of like, do you want to cut off your hand or do you want to keep your fingers? I'm not saying they're good sideboards. I'm just saying they're the sideboards that we have in the world. It's a non-choice and a choice, right? You know, who in the world is going to say, okay, hand for alternative number one? What? No, okay. But I do have- Next. I do, good idea. Let's do but good. Under, under the environmental impact study, I have to study the alternatives. Uh, well, I like, you know, no action alternative over there, but we- that yeah, one we can't do that. That one was an alternative. You yeah. said we couldn't. Do it. So, Mr. Well, Stelter, we can do it, but there are repercussions. Yeah. What, since we have the deadline at the end of the year, what are you asking of council? Are these are broad enough? Not that you like them. Not that it answers all the questions, but are they the broad enough sideboards? I guess lose your arm, cut your finger. Turn two. Alternative one or alternative? Are, are you asking for a decision like, tonight? No, I'm just like, to put, like, are we missing anything? Oh, okay. not, not a decision, just like everything. Like, oh, we're, 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 oh, we're all. Uh, Councilman Martin. Yeah. Um, I haven't had the, the budget discussion yet, so I don't know, but I know, like, at the county with planning land services, when they were doing tons of stuff, they're bringing in all kinds of revenue, which was balancing the entire budget. And then, likewise, when they weren't, it really hurt. So I don't know how the city's set up, but but are we set up that way? Are we are we taking dollars from you know collecting all those those fees and everything and putting it in the general fund? And if we slow growth, does that hurt our our budget? Ms. Ryerson, are you still with us? I would say we're I'm working. Here. Okay. Oh, okay. I, I'll let I'll let the CFO. I have something, but I'll let the CFO go first. 
I was going to say Jason could probably answer it just as well as I can. Um, so I look at the budget every uh, two years, and I work closely with uh, the director. And um, so no, yes and no, I guess. Yes, the money does go to the general fund. Um, but no, we're not built to run our budget specifically off of the planning fees. And this year is a budget year, yes? Correct. Yeah. And I would say one thing that those fees take into account are both residential and non-residential development. So one of our big focus and kind of pivots, and, I, and I've been trying to get, and I've been working on this for a couple of years, is pivoting to more commercial development. So you're adding, how's it, you're adding development that also adds revenue more than it demands service. So as you add industrial parks, you're adding property taxes, different taxes from development from operation of the economy, and the services those facilities demand from a governmental service standpoint, police services, planning services, code enforcement services, is typically lower than if you're building single family neighborhoods from an economic standpoint. So it's part of what we're trying to do is, and that's why we developed East Town is the way we're doing it, is trying to post, got to move our portfolio of development right. toward more of that commercial, industrial creation. Also as a way of trying to deal with traffic congestion, because if we can put jobs out here, hopefully people will drive less on 410, they can just go here locally. So that's, does that answer your question, kind of how we're trying to balance the both of them? Mm -hmm. How does uh, developing the industrial area help with the growth management that we're having to provide housing. And then we're taking property from what could have been more housing that wouldn't have been like downtown Bonnie Lake, but we're adding structure businesses. So yeah, income, I guess, for people who want to drive to work in Bonnie Lake, but how do, does that take away from the property that we have left? We have very little property left actually to develop homes. And how are we supposed to keep up with their growth management if we don't even have property left to put right. and houses that's, on? That's what I'm saying is I think in our case, the, the policies that are coming from Puget Sound Regional Council are more in line with I think what the council is looking at long term. I think building, you know, building houses out in East Town right now is kind of we're moving in direction to build the industrial, um, but I think that would have added more traffic congestion because you have all those residents now trying to get out to East Town versus reverse commuting. People leaving East Town at night where 410 is a lot more open than it is in the morning, right? So that's part of the strategies. And going back to Councilman Watson's question is how you deal with traffic congestion is how you also kind of lay out your city. And so we're trying to balance those two things. Um, but adding that out there, so it's already built into the analysis. Um, not to say we can't pull on that plan for different things, but right now that's where we're focused on spending, someone is spending significant money to construct a lot of different job type creating businesses out there that will hopefully employ finding for us. Then we need to send out a message to all of the businesses, especially whoever owns all of the little, you know, strip mall areas hey if you want to build up we're going to give you a discount so we can and there are some strategies and give them a job underneath so they just have to walk downstairs and we'll give you even a bigger discount because you're not requiring parking space and um, so do we have one more slide i'm done I, okay i think i've got enough all right Councilor. So at least i'll yeah, start I, working I, in a direction I, I have one observation about um by the classification of the city because we don't have um, a train and our public transportation. If we're going to bend the trend, it makes sense we bend the trend so that the people who um, need public transportation are close to public transportation. That would be where we're sitting right now, right? Um, we don't have public transportation past Wendy. Yeah. Right? So, um, if we try to spread uh, low-income housing out through the whole city, we're kidding ourselves, right? We're not helping anybody. If we really want to help and solve the problem of providing housing that's useful, it's useful when they can walk across the street, jump on the bus, take the train somewhere, right? It's not useful, except 
very close to the new uh, development, economic development out in East County. We've already built that up for the most part up there, right? So, so I, you know, I don't know. I just like I would apartment think complexes here or businesses with apartment complexes, which is kind of what we had discussed last year, year before last when we had our retreat. Was Breaking it like business area right here with a park in the middle and parking around the outside and then building up so that people can live. I mean, we, change, we, need to, we don't need to do anything except change the zoning to say this is possible. And then ideally, if we really care and want to be effective, we would recruit private people to help us build it. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. All right. And uh, in moving this along, we do have another full issue that we need to, uh, to discuss. So do we have any other questions or discussions for planning commission before we excuse? I'm going to take that silence as a no. And so we will now end the joint city council workshop planning commission meeting and continue on with the regular council workshop. Thank you very much, commissioners. For being here. And thank you for your time. We appreciate yes. it. Yes. And be very careful getting home. I'm hoping that the wet people are wrong. <laughs> All right, we can have a review of council minutes. Uh, council member Fullerton. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had a few changes and I believe those were made. I sent this to Candace. Okay. All right. Thank are, you. Are we going to have, <laughs> do, are we still going to have Fullerton and Deputy Mayor Carter do them or is there anyone else? Yeah. Right now that we had three, are you two still wanting to do it? I, I forwarded my comments to uh, Candace and Deputy Mayor Carter. If anybody else wants to, they're welcome to. If not, we just need to know who to send them to. Right. Okay. Yeah, just keep sending them to See you too. Perfect. All right, so let's move on to uh, council open discussion. Um, do we have any over, over, over discussion right now, council member Um Just super duper quick. Uh, two years is going to be the 200th anniversary of the Constitution. Uh, I think it's an opportunity for us to begin planning some uh, milestones, maybe some of our projects to coincide with that. Um, it'd be nice to see some energy behind uh, recognizing our veterans. We uh, we owe them a great debt. That's a perfect time to do that. Um, so there's that. The other thing is I had a chance to um, uh, attend a workshop on uh, uh, human trafficking. I have some material here from the people who did that. Is excellent. These are real tools for Not people we love that, that are caught in that, right? And it happens um, a lot closer than we think. It, it's here. It, yeah. You know, it's here. You probably find see people in the stores that are victims. Uh, so anyway, uh, those those things. And then the other thing is there was a training that I was uh, uh, I happened to take on um, self governance that I thought was really effective, and I was thinking about um, uh, perhaps trying to see if we can maybe get our retreat and part of that training, like a two hour brief from the facilitator on self-governance and what that looks like. Yeah, those are points very well taken. Uh, yes. Uh, we won't be time at the retreat, but we do have something planned in February for governance training. Council. Good. All right. Is that like constitutional training? training? It's not constitutional training. Um, it's other training, and we're looking into the constitutional, but they're we're looking into trying to find some for the constitution too. It's okay. Just I'll send you one. I took that. I thought it was really, yeah. really it, It's funding is a lot of it. Um, those trainings are really expensive to have somebody come out because I've looked into several. Um, and it's just having them funds available to do those kind of trainings. As they retreat their goal, won't have time. Yeah. All right. Oh, I'm sorry. 
Um, any further yeah, commentary I before we move to Mr. Important. Sullivan again? Yeah, I that I asked them. Any further open discussion? We have one more uh, presentation, Mr. Um, Sullivan, who's had a very busy night. Yeah, I've got some. I, I think it's okay. Yeah, I've got so, some more uh, I know this is not my favorite subject to talk about. Um, I know that uh, former council member Evans had brought up at one of our public safety meetings and then also at a workshop about uh, the fireworks. So my comment to him was he wanted to ban the fireworks in Bonnie Lake. And I said, well, put it on the ballot because I don't want to, I'm, I'm not banning fireworks. Uh, I, so, and then he brought it up again and he did state that if we didn't put it on the ballot, he was going to come back and haunt us. And then we did get a comment uh, from uh, the public last week on fireworks that was sent in an email form. So I don't know if we want to discuss possibly putting it on a ballot at some point, or if we want to put it on um, 2025. But I believe if we do that, it would have to we'd have to start the process possibly in February. And I'd also like to get the opinion of our uh, police chief as well as our fire chief and see what their thoughts are, you know, rather than just kind of go willy nilly. Hey, we're just going to throw this stuff out there because, you know, we think fireworks bad. But because <laughs> honestly, I love the fireworks. I, it, it's beautiful and um, it is patriotic and, and it's brighter. And it's only a certain days of the year. So I just, I love it. But well, I, you know, I do, do want to honor former member um, or formal council member Evans request to consider putting it on the ballot or have a discussion at some point. And then also the citizen that wrote in um, mm -hmm. about having PTSD essentially from the from the fireworks. Well, we need to address it because council member Evans is going to haunt us anything. So anyway, I'm just putting it out there on the table and just um, throw that to the wind. That's all I've got. Okay, any further discussion before we move on? Okay, seeing no other uh, open discussion, um, we will hand for. Oh, no, 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 that has been stricken. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Farther. <laughs> and we have one presentation with discussion on the coordination of cooperative wastewater services uh, from Mr. Sullivan again. Madam Clerk. Yeah. This is. <laughs> Item e, which Justin is Mr. Johnstone. 24-06, motion M24-06, a motion of the city of Bonnie Lake, Pierce County, Washington, authorizing the mayor to sign the interlocal agreement between the city of Bonnie Lake and the city of Sumner for the coordination of cooperative wastewater services. This is for discussion after a short presentation from Mr. Johnstone. Okay, Mr. Johnstone. All right, I will make this as quick as possible. I know it's been a long evening, and this has also been in front of you a few times now, but I did want to, uh, before hopefully getting to a place where we can uh, reach a, a authorization for the mayor to sign next week, uh, I did want to give everybody a base understanding here of the history behind this, as at this point in time, we're talking about nearly 50 years of history centered around the handling and treatment of wastewater from the city of Bonnie Lake. So, with that, I'm going to move on. I will tell you that the, some of these slides are kind of wordy. I'm going to do my best to just like bang through them really quick and hit the high points. I'm happy to send this to you or it will be at the end. We can make it available to you if you want to look at it more. So anyways, in order to get started, we're going to jump back to the year 1975. I was two years old and very much time. Uh, Bonnie Lake, Pierce County and Southfield Sewer District inter uh, executed an interlocal to develop a facility and plan that out would outline how to meet their regional wastewater goals. Uh, they received federal and state funds to get this plan done, and off they went. Uh, in 1977, that plan was completed. Some interesting uh, subject matter in there is that they picked a site for construction of the regional wastewater treatment facility that would discharge into the Puyallup River. Uh, that plan was actually approved uh, by the County Board of Commissioners and the EPA in, in, in later in that year. Uh, during the same time, the city started working on the construction of the sewer system, collection system infrastructure, um, and uh, additional grant funds were obtained to, to construct that. 
However, we hit a little bit of a snag when uh, the County Planning Count, uh, Commission denied an unclassified use permit for the proposed wastewater treatment facility that was to be built down in the Alderton area and the project started to skid to a, st uh, a stop. Uh, in response to that, in 1979, that facility plan was completed two years earlier, was amended to include Addendum 3. Uh, and the highlight of that is that this is where the decision was made that conveyance of the city's wastewater, City of Bonnie Lake, would go to the Summit Wastewater Treatment Facility. Uh, in addition to that, it would also include uh, what was recommended was construction of the gravity transmission mainly to extend between the two cities. This was approved by the County Board of Commissioners and the EPA in 1979. Following year, Bonnie Lake, Sumner, Pierce County, and the Southville Sewer District executed an additional uh, ILA, which would provide for the design, construction, and operation of the expanded plant. So obviously, the plant at Sumner needed to get bigger in order to treat that extra wastewater. So that was the direction here in 1980. However, later in that year, the EPA and Ecology changed their grant requirements to require a larger local match. And because of that, uh, uh, Pierce County withdrew its participation from the project. They were a key member of the team at that time. And so that created an issue. What that prompted was the city to, uh, uh, to start a planning effort locally to figure out what are other ways that we can handle our and dispose of our own wastewater. So that went back to constructing a small independent facility that would serve the city only. It was no longer a regional facility. The idea is just one plan to serve Bonnie Lake. There was a local improvement district proposed to finance the construction effort that was rejected by voters in 1983, effectively killing that alternative. During the same time, uh, there was a recall campaign. The mayor was recalled. Most of the council quit. And so the new mayor and city council announced new plans that have abandoned the efforts of developing the sewer system. Um, at this point, the federal government said, we gave you money to build something. Why aren't you giving us what you said you were going to build? We want our money back. Uh, this was obviously a huge problem. Um, the city appealed EPA's decision. Uh, that in turn, also the city and South Hill Sewer District filed suit against the county. There was settlement discussions. Sorry, I'm just moving quickly through this. Um, and then finally, what was uh, the decision that was made after all of the legal wranglings that the expansion of the existing plant in Sumner would be back on as the plan to move forward with. Pierce County agreed to participate, and a new ILA was entered into. <laughs> this is a really entertaining op-ed piece that I would, uh, I'll would i send to you if, if you would like to see it. I was going to read it. I'm not right now, but those are pipes with teeth, so that gives you some idea of what it's talking about. <laughs> Moving on, 1984, uh, Bonnie Lake, Sumner, Pierce County, and the South Hill Sewer District uh, executed a new agreement. Uh, this agreement was to... Uh, uh, determine how they're going to improve existing wastewater transmission among those different regions and take it all down to um, uh, uh, the summer wastewater treatment facility. This is the, where we begin to see discussions about joint capacity ownership of the summer wastewater treatment facility. Uh, in 1991, uh, Pierce County acquires the Southville Sewer District, which up to this point had been its own entity, and all of that is incorporated into the Chambers Creek sewerage system. 2002, Pierce County and Bonnie Lake, Bonnie Lake execute the Sanitary Sewer Transfer Agreement. What this did is it basically took uh, transfers of the county's uh, sewer service area um, that were necessary to align with the urban growth uh, area boundaries established as part of the growth, growth Management Act. So basically, we were right-sizing the sewer service area to incorporate those areas that were not incorporated before they belonged to Pierce County. Um, it basically outlined terms and conditions of the transfer uh, and um, uh, and uh, basically formalized that those areas would be included in the city of Bonnie Lake uh, sewer service area, and that, that would all then go to the um, summer wastewater treatment facility. So shifting gears, now we're going to go specifically to the interlocal agreements. As you know, what we're talking about is a third. So obviously there's been two prior to that. The first one was initiated in 2002, the next one in 2012. These, what is shown here is the purpose statements taken directly out of each of those agreements. I'm not going to bother to read through them, but basically they say, hey, this is an emergency. We need to agree to upgrade the plant down in Sumner. We've got, you know, you're going to, we're going to agree on who's going to run the consultants, how we're going to pay for these improvements, and what's going to happen with the capacity of the plant. 
the 2012 uh, purpose statement was basically a restatement of the 2002 uh, purpose statement, except that uh, there was a few fault, uh, uh, clarifying words and phrases in, inserted, and they took out some language specific to the 2002 agreement. So I will continue moving. That brings us to the proposed interlocal agree, uh, agreement that uh, we're now calling 2024 uh, Cooperative Wastewater Agreement. The purpose here is to basically address how we're going to manage and share costs at the uh, at the summer wastewater treatment facility. We're going to define capacity ownership and we're going to describe how the amount the uh, uh, how how those amounts will be used moving forward. In addition, and probably honestly one of the biggest drivers here, if not the biggest driver here, is that under the Federal Clean Water Act administered through the Department of Ecology at the state level, we're required to have a pre-treatment program for non-industrial wastewater. So what that means is we have to have a program set up that will go to all our non-residential uh, non users um, and ensure that what they are discharging complies with uh, necessary regulations so that we can avoid having any biological upsets or any disturbances to the environment that uh, down to the treatment plant where it discharges into the river. In addition to that, we use, we use this opportunity to remove outdated legacy language that spoke about previous projects, you know, and um, the management of those projects. Um, and then we also decided to use this opportunity to uh, add additional language to increase transparency and, and frankly, to uh, help strengthen Bonnie Lake's position when, it, uh, you know, when we're talking about how this uh, facility is shared. These were things that were not included in the previous ILA. So what changed on the right, uh, on, excuse me, on the left side of the screen, you see what's what we're calling the deleted provisions from the 2012 agreement. And I just listed the section headings there. Those are that is all language that was deleted from the new uh, uh, ILA. What we added to the new ILA is section two, which is the definition of terms. Section three, we actually specify a mandatory review period every five years that the agreement must be reviewed. Uh, looks like I got my section numbers backwards here, but I'll go ahead and jump to section five, which says uh, joint facility operational maintenance. We clarify capacity ownership, management, consultant responsibilities, and we have the new pre-treatment program in there. Section four, administration. We increase the number of council seats on the joint advisory committee to three from one. <clears throat> We create a technical working group at the staff level, that which will be responsible for reviewing many things, including any expenses that come up that could be or that would be more than $100,000. The technical working group will make recommendations to the joint advisor committee as needed uh, and when necessary. Uh, section six, cost sharing. We actually went into the details regarding how budget is set, how billing is to occur, how it's calculated. Uh, how we go about planning for capital uh, and compliance improvements and how we're going to handle unbudgeted major operating expenses. And then finally, we have now an, an actual termination clause in there, which at this point, the notice of termination has a 10 year advance notice requirement. However, uh, we still see that as advantage considering there was nothing like that in the previous agreement. So the city of Bonnie Lake does have the option now to be able to say, hey, here's our 10 year notice we're out. And the reason that 10 years was said is because right now at the staff level, we believe that's reasonable for the time it would take to get permitting, financing together, design, and actually construct an alternative treatment plan to what we're currently using in summer. So what happens if the new ILA is not approved? Um, I, I, I point at council member compliance. It's this, that's his question. Uh, so it's, if it's not, if it's not approved, we continue to uh, work under the terms of the previous ILA. Uh, however, we will need to come forward with a secondary agreement, if you will, that would govern or would, would establish the pre-treatment program. The pre-treatment program is required by law. We have no flexibility there. And so we would need to continue to that part of all of this to move forward. Um, and then also, if it's not, if this new uh, ILA is not approved, the new provisions that we Tried to get in there to, uh, you know, to to create greater engagement, uh, transparency, uh, and accountability will not be part of the agreement. So we won't have those things. We won't have the termination clause. We won't have the mandatory five-year review period. We won't have some of those other things that make this new agreement uh, uh, much better. What happens if it is approved? Uh, the new ILA takes effect. The city council will need to appoint three members to the joint advisory committee. 
Uh, we will start a meeting with Sumner staff as part of the technical working group, uh, and the city will have greater ability to obtain records and information about the facility and operations of the corporate. And that is the end of my presentation. I'm happy to take questions. As I said, my desire is that this will be on the agenda for next week for authorization for the mayor to sign. And I have, as part of this, that uh, it could potentially go on the upcoming good agenda, but the council member requirements um, and in just second guessing, this is this is something you wouldn't want on the uh, on the consent agenda. I didn't think so. So um, we would uh, instead of going through that and then having a modification, uh, can that be Can we just put it on for a full one? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank you, uh, Mr. Johnstone. Do we have any questions at the moment for uh, yes, Councilmember Ball? You you said that was so fast. Are you saying you're tabling this so that we can talk more about this? I thought no. you said it the time zero. But you, the mayor has to sign it next week. I swear to you. No, I, uh, the staff's recommendation would be that it would move forward for approval or uh, for council's authorization for the mayor to sign next week. But if you choose to just have it for discussion, we're just wait. Okay. 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 Next. Yeah, he, he's talking about putting on full council issues rather than a consent. So no, that's that's so not different. Yeah. We would still vote essentially next and have another discussion period available. But that's at the council level. I'll stay in these questions for next year. Well, that that what the I would ask for. Now. Yeah. Are you, are you for real? Yeah. 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 No, that's why I told you. I just trying to table this thing. Yeah. Because it's like I don't even I don't even know. But, you know, because I think that um, in my mind, you know, Council Member uh, McClendon said one of the most excellent points that I've heard in a long time was about no levers and dials. So, you know, this particular agreement is very well done and it's put together by staff and covers a lot of different things, but it doesn't change anything. So, you know, for me as a council member, I'm like, look at this thing like, really? You know, and there's a bunch of like weird stuff going on in the background there with it. but. You know, I don't really see the necessity, but, you know, alternatively, critically, I have to look at myself and say, well, what's the alternative? Um, and um, I, that's what I look for with other members. So, you know, it's like, if I don't vote, I'm clearly not going to vote for this particular version of the data but that doesn't really matter because, you know, what's the better idea? What's what the no alternative in my line right now for me is okay because we still continue to trudge along with our agreement. I'm not too excited about, but it has worked out fairly well. The council looked into it significantly, you know, like our fire inspection services is being done by some there, which is great. I think there needs to be a lot more cooperation there on different issues. This also puts the sewer inspection for commercial type activities um, within Sumner's jurisdiction. So we have that thing going on again. I think that probably goes on pretty well. I think there's a lot of sharing thing needs to go on there. But you know, short answer, long answer is just like, yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. no whether council member climbing is still in the same, or did you think of some better way to do this kind of thing? Because what what's the alternative? I don't have one right now. I know, right? There's no other option. We gotta put oh, stuff well. somewhere. Oh no, it goes down there and right now it continues on. You know, there's yeah. no it's not like tomorrow they're gonna shut the thing off. Right. That's there is an option. Just pull the pre-treatment language out, move that forward, and say we're gonna work toward the rest of the agreement. That is an option. That's not I, that, I don't know if that, that I think that's worse than what we have currently. But we have to, you know, there yeah, we look at this and um uh, but yeah, I'm still uncomfortable with it as well as, as council member Swatman. So um, now, Mr. Johnson, if you could just make it. credit to Mr. Johnson's credit, they've worked really hard on this, and they have um, uh, uh, along with council to try to give us mechanisms. Right? Come a long way. But but you know, are they are they effective, and what are the, the what what I don't have in my mind is the the, the not, I'm looking for knobs and dials to help us ensure that for um, 
our utility rate, the utility system that we have dials that is visibility into the system and why it's expensive and knobs to help us control those expenses going forward. And I don't see a lot of knobs and dials in here. I see some visibility that the three members on council will go nowhere, but there's no dot, right? Because all they can do is just say, oh, count on staff to go to a working group. And Sumner can still decide they're going to do what they want to do. Right? There's nothing. We, and if they do something we don't agree with, then we give them a 10 year notice. Right. Um, now, Mr. Johnson, we've already that uh, Councilmember Pond talked about. That is mandatory, right? That's federal law that, that has that we have to comply with. And it's already to do with the Clean Water Act. So right. That's, yeah. But that's unrelated to this agreement that just happens to be here. Yep. Can we separate it? Yeah, it was, it was included in this agreement because it, it was included as a, there was a, a section in the 2012 agreement that said, hey, when this becomes a requirement, we'll address it through a new ILA. Okay. So, and uh, Councilmember Rocher has a comment. So, a question on, um, so I think we took out three loans previously, you know, taking care of certain things. Are we gonna have any on the horizon here that we need to take out to take care of things that we know unless we hit capacity and have to do something? The, there will be, we're gonna have to pursue additional funding to complete the dryer project that's currently underway uh, design-wise down in the city of Sumner. Uh, and right now uh, I'd have to uh, have Sumner uh, at our, our team, our engineering team that's been meeting with them confirming but I think that that upgrade is somewhere around a $13 million project total. $13 million. So, and that's coming up in their work on it right now, so. They're working on it right now. Um, I'd have to get a debrief from my engineering folks, but I think they're getting ready to go through a pre-procurement process for some of the equipment. Um, I would anticipate, I believe we were talking construction in 25. So here. Yeah, so. So when we get to that point where we've got to borrow the thirteen million dollars, is that a split? So we would lose. We would be, we would be borrowing a portion of that. We would be part, uh, borrowing fifty-four percent of that, <coughs> based on, on usage. It's based on our capacity ownership, right? So when that happens, if it follows what the other twenty million loans were, we're going to have an additional probably three hundred thousand a year. I, I hesitate to say exactly what it would be, but yes, there will be additional debt service to be paid towards that. Because what we're the mechanism that we're planning on doing is similar to what we've done with the city of Sumner in the past to join and pursue public works trust fund loans to complete the project. That's been the same vehicle that's been used previously to do the plan expansion projects. Okay. I'm just looking, I think you've done great work on this. I, I mean, I can't negotiate, but we're in a we're not in a position where we're gonna negotiate this. We've been done for 30 years or whatever. And it is what it is. But I'm trying to look at, you know, reducing those costs. We talked about the, the pilot fees that are now done. So we are, we do have that money available each month. The mm -hmm. first one, I believe, is going to come due in July, which is going to free up more money. So mm -hmm. potentially you could take that money to reduce rates, but it looks like we're going to go right back into another loan. And I think it might be pretty much a wash uh, <laughs> that we will be paying off some debt service here before too long. Um, and uh, Sherry can discuss this a little bit more. This is probably new for her since she's been away from the office. Yeah. In the discussion you and I had, Councilmember Roche, but um, there there is some debt service coming off. There, I believe there was three that I sent you. Um, one to be paid off, I believe, this year. The other two further out. I think there were twenty thirty and something similar. Sounds like a ride. Sherry here. here. Treated if we're doing it in May. This is coming up in July. Yeah. yeah. Um, Sherry, the council um, member wrote a question that pertained to yes. using service payments to pay, yep. pay down, essentially. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. yes. Okay. Um, that was all factored into the FCS rates. So, Ryan, was this project in the FCS rates? The uh, driver project? Correct. Take a look. I believe it, it was. If not, then this will be an additional loan and require additional money. Um, because the loans coming off was factored into our current rates. So there's no quote savings. Okay. okay. And when you say FCS, just for clarification, what does that stand for? Uh, that's uh, our consultants, financial consulting. Oh, that's like services, right? Services, I believe. Yeah. And Kessmer Fulton, so you're registered. Well, I'm just looking at this 
I'm confused on this capacity ownership for the joint facility. And that if Bonnie Leak is a 54% owner and Summer's only a 46%, then as far as I'm concerned, we own, if we had shares, we own the lion's share and we should have more decisions. But we don't have any ownership. That's capacity. You're talking about that's 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 ownership. Or that's uh, correct. That's uh, treatment. Yeah, that's but treatment it's based capacity. on research. Yeah, right. it's yeah, we use 54% of yeah. the system. Mm -hmm. Right. So we, that, we, essentially, what she said is still that's why we out of, the, out of the total treatment capacity of the plant, we own 54% of that. Okay. One more question for sure. Yes, Councilman. Gary, the, the payment in lieu of taxes money, was that factored in as well? Yeah, it was. That, so there's no savings there either. Okay. Um, any further questions before we? Um, or, or I do. Meetings? I do. Sorry, guys. I know it's hard with me not being on screen. Um, with the cost that the citizens that are on sewer pay, is that because of us paying the city of Sumner to use that facility? Is that why our sewer rates are so high? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, just briefly, your sewer rates are uh, basically composed of two components. You have an availability fee, and then you have a volumetric fee. So, what the, uh, our our sewer users are paying is is based off of both of those things. Your your availability fee is really what is set at such a, a point that if if everybody stopped using sewer and paid zero on their volumetric, that base fee revenue will still cover your maintenance and operations forward um so uh it, it's a combination of the two i guess this is a short answer Councilman. yeah the 12 percent or whatever it is currently for the general fund oh, yeah it's that utility tax yeah something like that you know there's all kinds of issues there tell me why summer's rate is you know that's an open question then right and totally different than ours so that's always been a book yeah whatever okay we talked about it at the committee level for yeah. Well, you know, does anybody else have any further questions before we close the meeting out and try to uh, move on? Council Member Plant. So, is this on the agenda for next week for approval? Yeah, Council, yeah, Deputy Mayor. Council, yes. Council, what does Council want to do? Yeah. Next week. What's that? We'll find out next week. Okay, so we'll put it on the agenda and go from there. Yeah, full council issues. There you go. All right. Well, I believe that brings our meeting to a close. Excellent presentation from both of you, and thank you for enduring my passionate query. I was going to. Thank you, too. And let's bring this meeting to a close. That's it. I think I said that.